Ravi? Uh, we are uh, going live. Have we no, started? Mohanty is still missing. Yeah, yeah, he'll join us soon. Okay. Okay. So I think we can start with the proceedings. Is that all right, okay. Doctor Pradeep, Doctor Sandeep, Doctor Dheeraj? Please unmute yourself. Doctor Pradeep, start. Ah, oh, please start. We are live. We are live. On behalf of the Maharashtra Orthopedic Association and the Bombay Orthopedic Society, I welcome all the faculty from the Delhi Orthopedic Association, the dignitaries from the Delhi Orthopedic Association, the dignitaries from the Maharashtra Orthopedic Association and Bombay Orthopedic Society, and the entire faculty from the Maharashtra Orthopedic Association and the Bombay Orthopedic Society to this live webinar called Momentum. May I now request the president of the Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, Professor Dr. Ajit Shinde, to kindly give his welcome address. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I, Dr. Ajit Shinde, Chairman of IOCON 2020, Organizing Committee, and President of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, welcome you all to this webinar. I wish you all and your loved ones safe life in this crisis. This webinar series, Momentum is a MOA BOS initiation. As already mentioned, Momentum is created to bring all the state chapters of IOA together for a great learning experience, which is the basic motto of IOCON. Every Sunday, we are going to involve one state chapter. Today, gate chapter is Delhi Orthopedic Association and topic is neglected trauma proximal humerus fracture. I think it has been chosen wisely by my team as we will see number of such a neglected cases post lockdown time. To make this webinar informative, to update our knowledge, we are having seven stalwarts from Delhi Orthopedic Association and Maharashtra Orthopedic Association. I thank Delhi Orthopedic Association President Sharad Agrawal and Secretary Dr. Hitesh Lal for their enthusiastic participation. And we have Dr. Jitendra Maheshwari, Dr. Vivek Traika, Dr. Raman Kant Agrawal, and Dr. Ravi South, who are eminent faculties from Delhi. We all know Dr. S.R. Mukhi, who is a senior leading orthopedic surgeon from Mumbai. Dr. Vijay Kakatkar, leading orthopedic surgeon from Nasik, who also is a past president of MOA. Dr. Sanjay Dhar, eminent orthopedic surgeon and professor at Dr. D.Y. Patil Medical College, who also happens to be past secretary of BOS. I am sure that all these faculties will make discussion interesting and informative. So without wasting time, we shall begin. Jai Hind, Jai Maharashtra. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I just request Dr. Ram Chadda to give a small appeal on behalf of IOCON 2020. Good morning, friends. I hope all of you are safe, home, and healthy. We orthopedic surgeons believe that any form of faith can overcome any fear. We all believe that we are going to meet in IOCON 2020 in December this year in Mumbai. This is the momentum that we are gathering with each one of you weekly. Delhi Orthopedic Association taking the lead in joining hands with MOA and BOS to carry this torch of academics and education with a lot of vigor towards IACON 2020. Please participate in large numbers. Please spread the word of IACON 2020 and be there academically to participate in what should be a landmark conference this year. Without much ado, I welcome each one of you the faculty, the organizers, and all the delegates enjoy the neglected trauma that you would also need to treat 
as and when we get out of this lockdown. All the best. God bless you. See you in Mumbai. Take care. Thank you very much, sir. I now hand over the proceedings to our two moderators, Professor S.S. Bohanti, who is the president of the Bombay Orthopedic Society, and Dr. Narayan Karde, who is the honorary secretary of the Maharashtra Orthopedic Association. Over to you, sir. Uh, let me on. Okay. Okay, friends, good morning. Now, uh, I welcome you to this uh, IOCON 2020 a joint uh, initiative by MOA, Maharashtra Orthopedic Association and Bombay Orthopedic Society. And uh, we are grateful to Delhi Orthopedic Association, especially President Dr. Sarad Agrawal and uh, Secretary Dr. Titesh Lal for uh, taking the lead and uh, initiating this momentum. So without wasting much time, let me invite uh, Dr. Jitendra Maheshwari from Delhi, who is the director of the orthopedics and Marx super specialty hospital. Uh, Dr. Maheshwari, over to you to present your case and uh, you will be uh, moderating this session and uh, we'll just pick up the questions which have been put up uh, there. And uh, for each case, we devote uh, about 15 minutes. So please stick to your time of presentation so that uh, if you can present for about say four or five minutes, then we can generate more of discussion. Over to Dr. Maheshwari, please. We are already seeing his uh, screen now. Now, can you make it slide so, please? Yeah. Dr. Maheshwari, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, somebody has to unmute me. Actually. Yeah, yeah. now, now done, we can done, hear sir, done. Done. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Right. Uh, first of all, thanks to uh, organizing team of IOA for this very, very nice gesture to involve the whole country. And also I'm privileged to be uh, representing Delhi Orthopedics here and I'm very happy about it. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal for giving me this opportunity. So I'm going to present this case of neglected proximal humerus. A uh, 45 year old man, active, dominant hand right side had this fracture dislocation uh, about five months prior to he visited me. Uh, no question about the initial treatment. I'm sure everybody will do a open reduction internal fixation. That's what was done. And I'm sure from the, the way the stitches have been put, you can realize how great the surgeon must be. He must be a really acknowledged surgeon and very good fixation. Everything looks very good. Till three months later, when the person got the x-ray done and that was the x-ray, he wasn't happy because he was still not able to lift his hand. And that's the time about five months after the surgery he decided to come to Delhi from Patna and that is what the function was. He has hardly any movement. It was more or less a pseudo paralysis and something is wrong. Though the X-ray on the left doesn't look too bad, but looking at the clinical situation, we knew that rotator cuff is not in its place in this case. And uh, one has to do something. Obviously one could do an MRI to find out what's happening. Uh, I decided to do another X-ray, which I do now quite often is what is called a profile x-ray. A lot of these plates hide a lot of things. So if you do a profile x-ray, and as you can see, the whole GT is missing here. It was visible a little bit there as well, but you know, here you could see the GT, but in this, it was completely missing. And I knew the reason is that the GT has been pulled off and all the rotator cuff tear has gone. So there was no doubt in my mind that this is what I'm dealing with. We did a CT scan, which is expected in such a case. And we can see the GT is lying all the way behind and there's no GT here. In addition, quite a few of the screws are actually, you know, penetrating the shoulder joint. The union looked quite reasonable to me. And I thought we can discuss with the patient what are the options at this moment. So what do we have? We have a united fracture as per our assessment. Till now, we have a rotator cuff deficiency in the case. We have a screw penetration and a possible AVN because anything which is a fracture dislocation to start with can always have a AVM developing sometimes. So those are our kind of background diagnosis and that is the clinical picture of the case and that's the X-ray picture of the case. So now the question is, what do you do? Options you have is just remove the implant because one of the bolt is penetrating inside, it will cause damage, it's causing pain already a little bit. 
Second, remove the implant at the same time, try and refix the cuff. Five months down the line, gone posteriorly, tough job, but still, one can always try to refix it and expect some functions. Reverse shoulder is always in possibility, but this guy is 43 year old. I would keep it as a last option and I would try to save the head as much as possible. But we know fixing uh, GT after five, six months is a tough job to get that rotator cuff functional. With those things, we decided we take up the patient and as is the ritual, always work up for any infection that was not normal. And I just, because I do quite a few arthroscopy as a curiosity, I thought, let me see inside what's happening. And this is a landmark picture I want to share with everybody. That's how it looked inside. The screws were poking so big. Two of them was almost, you know, eating up the glenoid on the other side. And that is the picture of the glenoid. Almost 50% cartilage was destroyed. And, you know, at this stage, without even opening up, I was wondering what to do. At 43, I don't want to do a replacement, but uh, if, if replacement, it is reverse. So I'm quite, a, in a way, quite anti-reverse. So I thought, what to do now? So we had to remove the screw, but what would we do next with this kind of a picture inside? So I opened up from the deltopectoral approach from which the first surgery was done. And to my surprise, as soon as I removed the plate, there was a non-union. I could see mobility between the head there and the, the shaft here. And the, the, the cuff was all in one piece here, which had distracted early maybe. So, but the, luckily the head was vascular. It was all quite red. So this was the picture as soon as I removed the plate and it made my job more difficult. I, have, I was prepared for a reverse, but I was quite reluctant to do reverse in a 43 year old. Now, what choices do I have? Because it is non-union plus rotator cuff is gone, plus head is poked so many times by the bolts and I was lost, what should be done? So I gave it a thought and this is where we were. We had a non-union and not a united fracture now, made my job more difficult. The head was perforated by the multiple bolts that had been put, though it was vascular, that was a silver lining. And cuff with GT was evulsed, it was lying behind. And of course the glenoid was abraded. So this is the condition which we had in front of us on the table. What are the options? Best option is to do a reverse. If this patient was 70 plus, I would not th think twice, just go ahead and do the reverse. But in a 43 year old, no way. I have to reconstruct it, whatever way, whatever best I can do. And I thought, let me think how to reconstruct it. And that's where the whole story is. And we decided to do reconstruction and I did what I call a tambu technique. Tambu is a Hindi word. If you remember the Shamiana in marriages, it is banking only on one central pillar. As soon as you lift that pillar, the whole Shamiana is stable. So I thought we could do something like that. I took a fibula, made multiple drill holes in the tip of the fibula, and with a heavy number five ethibone sutures, sutured everything to that tambu. You know, GT, LT, everything. And it, everything came together like this. And this was fitting very well in this particular case in the medullary canal. In another case that I did, I put a screw here. But I could see because of the, you know, the tambu effect, because of the tight periosteum there, everything became very solid with this fixation. And on the table, I could move it. And I'll show you that video, that this is the video after fixing on the table. That is the head, this is the shaft, and this is the LPGP, which I'm going to fix subsequently to the holes that I've created here. And for just to remind, this is what it looked preoperatively. There was a non-union there. And this is what it looks now on the table, quite satisfied with the kind of fixation. Now I was in two mind whether I should put a plate in addition to this, but the fact that this was the post-op picture, I didn't put the plate because there were already too many screws. Avian was at risk and I know I will have another problem in my hand, screw penetrating again, avian, the head collapsing and things like that. So because I was comfortable with fixation, I avoided using a plate here and three months down the line, and then eventually six months down the line, that's how the whole thing looked. As you can see, there's an anchor here because I had to remove or, you know, kind of periosteally remove the deltoid to get a good exposure from there. But I fixed it back with a, uh, with a anchor there. And this is the picture, uh, six months post-op. He has a forward flexion of almost 90. Now it is one and a half year. I don't have his picture now. And this was the pre-op picture, and that is the six months post-op picture. The guy is very happy. 
He has no pain. He has a functional range of movement without a reverse inside his body. So I think we have been able to, uh, you know, salvage his head in spite of such a difficult situation. And I use this technique further in a fresh case, 64-year-old BMI 40 lady, where I was contemplating doing a reverse as a primary operation. But because she was so fat, I dreaded. So I did the same thing and it worked very well, even in that case. And I used a screw to stabilize this, but I tied everything to the to this head and it like a thumbu. Everything became very stable on the table, no implant inside, no future surgery requirement, and they get a reasonable function. So my key is that you know when you want to avoid reverse, particularly in younger people and particularly in our country, and uh, this is one option which I would like to propose. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maheshwari, for an excellent presentation and uh, the clarity was too good in this presentation. Uh, just uh, to start with, before I invite questions uh, from the beginning for the uh, beginners, uh, can you just uh, uh, tell that how to take that profile x-ray? First thing that uh, you told that there is a profile x-ray where you could uh, assess the better mm -hmm. tuberous. Yeah, so I think this is a message for youngsters. Yeah. A lot of time in orthopedics, we put implants. And implants cheat us because, you know, you do routine AP lateral, the whole plate is covering the fracture. You can't see whether it is united or not united. So always take the patient and take a profile X-ray. Now, how do you take profile X-ray? One way is that you, like in our hospital, we have a, uh, you know, fluoro-guided X-ray facility, but you can take the patient to any image intensifier and see in what position you get the best X-ray. Of course, image doesn't give you a good resolution, but you know in what position you will get the proper X-ray where the plate will lie on one side and you will be able to see the very common in forearm bones and every bone where there's a big plate hiding the fracture and debate goes on whether the fracture has healed or not. If only you see a profile x-ray, it can help you to see that everything is not okay under the plate. Okay. Now, other questions like, uh, did you do an EMG and MRI? Investigate no, I, I did not do an MRI because I knew the cause of problem is divulged uh, GT. And of course, MRI with plate also gives you all kind of funny information. So I did not do MRI there. And the EMG, no. I, I just clinically examined. The deltoid was functioning. So I did not do EMG as well. OK. Uh, did the fibula was fitting snugly inside the canal of uh, humerus? Uh, so that will provide the stability, correct? Yeah. Yeah. If the fibula is not fitting snugly inside the canal, then uh, there will be a problem. Suppose osteoporotic bones or something like that. Yes, then you have to use a screw, transfixing yeah. the fibula. Yeah, you have to fix the base. That is uh, one of the important messages, I think. You That's want the to second case it. that I showed in which yeah. I used the screw. Yeah. Dr. Karne, any, any questions uh, for Dr. Maheshwari? You have to unmute yourself, Dr. Karne. Yeah. Monty? Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Monty, Monty please. Yeah, please. Uh, I was a li little worried yes. about the fixation because I thought the fibula alone, even though on table we may, may find the good stability, uh, it may, we, we are not sure whether it will continue. So addition, putting a plate and a little shorter screw, if we are uh, feeling the screws are longer, will, will give you more stability. That's just opinion. Okay. Yeah, so the reason I chose not to use the plate, two reasons. One, in the primary surgery, a lot of screws had been put in the head. And it was perforated. Second, this was a fracture dislocation. I was expecting sooner or later this mice might go into AVN, in which my plate will become the mother-in-law. I will have to remove the plate compulsorily. And since on the table, as you could see, I was reasonably sure it is fixing. Well, I did immobilize for three weeks in abduction brace. And these fractures heal in three weeks. It's very interesting. Even in the fresh case, just three weeks of abduction, immobilization. And when I can move it, rotation, almost 30, 40 degree in both direction on the table. Upper humerus is a very good fracture. If you stabilize on the table, looks very stable. You continue immobilization for three more weeks. Take away all the disadvantages of the implant for future because they might cause you problems in future. So I did not use the plate for that reason. Yeah. In what position do you immobilize this? Just a normal abduction base, which is neutral like that much. Okay. Because I know I have to immobilize for three, four weeks. I don't want to end up with the internal rotation contracture. And from there to mobilize the shoulder is easier. So whenever I immobilize the shoulder for three weeks 
and no no mobilization at all it has to be in neutral position and not in a sling because from sling to go out to 30 40 degree of external rotation is impossible so whenever immobilized continuously for more than say few weeks three weeks definitely it should be in a abduction brace which keeps the shoulder in neutral position okay there are other questions like uh, dr professor ravi sotha is a uh, uh, giving an opinion that he uses a plate in addition to the fibula and i think dr mahesuri has clarified that thing uh, you had any fibula fracture or fibula failure from dr kitesh lal no so i have used fibula for uh, like in non unions quite a lot of time that has never happened the fibula has not never fractured in these cases and also in other lot of places we use fibula i have not had an opportunity where the fibula is fractured because there is always an implant to support in most of the places here i did not use the implant for a particular purpose yeah what suture material you used i think you have told that number 5 ethy bond you had used correct yeah yeah and um, fibular incorporation takes about a year or so that's what uh, professor ravi's opinion uh, yeah uh, dr agarwal you can speak yeah he wanted dr raman kant agarwal please unmute you unmute yourself and then you can speak raman unmute yourself yeah okay okay so there are couple of uh, things which i would have done differently i mean it's a great case uh, number one i would have definitely done an mri to find out about the fatty degeneration in the muscle belly the plate doesn't go that medial to the scapula and uh, one can always find out the uh, level of fatty degeneration it's not about the cuff it's about the muscle belly at least to document and make myself a little bit more wiser and not run into anxiety later on after having performed the surgery number one number 2 that was a very good thing you did do to go into the uh, shoulder to look at the cartilage status of the glenoid because the screws will definitely destroy the glenoid and uh, but i would have perhaps no evidence for that but i would have perhaps done micro drilling of the glenoid with a k wire or something at that point of time to give some kind of pseudo cartilage cover a micro fracture technique of the glenoid third yeah. i would have definitely done an emg but uh just for documentation but i am i agree with you the clinical examination of the deltoid is much better than the emg emg sometimes fails to uh, pick up the right thing and they will always say that this is going on this is going on this is going on but if the clinical contraction i feel i will go ahead with your judgment there fourth and this is a question why did you not put the plate dr mahesh there are two reasons i am asking for that the patient had a beautiful fixation and fracture failed to heal but as far as stability is concerned even with that stable fixation in the phylos in the first place fracture didn't heal because of whatever reason it is very difficult to imagine why did he go into non union uh, despite a very good fixation so when i'm dealing with a fracture or a non union the stability and the biology both are important and therefore uh, the biology component you took care of but stability was a little bit compromised i have done extensively intramedullary fibulas and uh, they do hold well but not that well that they could take the active force of deltoid contraction thank you okay dr uh, maheshwari your comments please before so, that so, let so, me so, first of all quickly before before uh, before you give your comments let me request dr tikha to share his screen so that we don't waste time Okay. okay. So quickly yeah. comment about uh, doing a EMG and uh, and uh, you know the MRI to see atrophy mm -hmm. in a forty-year-old fellow trauma five months. I don't expect any problem in these things. Clinical examination for the deltoid is better than EMG, no doubt about it. I'm not expecting any problem with rotator cuff because it's an injury situation. Now regarding fixation, I agree. But let me tell you, long back in AIMS, when we used to give time to for patient for internal fixation for upper humerus and waiting we used to be sometimes 3 3 weeks and uh, at least 2 3 times i have opened up the fracture and found the fracture is healed so this fracture actually heals in 3 months you have to just keep it there for 3 months and this fixation on the table appeared good enough and reason i did not use the plate is because the head was already buggered there were multiple holes and i was expecting a future avian i would have landed up with another surgery for this patient just trying to mobilize him early by fixing the plate i think as far as the keeping the fracture there was concerned this fixation was good enough with external 
there are some suggestions that you should use additional cancels or cancellous graft also from dr karne as well as uh, from dr mukhi then final yes. uh, one more final one more, uh, one more question from dr kakatkar please and then we'll move on to next case want you one question dr kakatkar please dr kakatkar wants you have given dr kakatkar one is question uh, yeah i'll i'll just just suggest you have to cut the screws short and put the same plate and with the cancellous bone graft the issue is solved you can use the allo graft of the fibula and the cancellous autogenous graft which will not allow it and will enhance the union earlier that is my suggestion and I take a yeah what is I've your done, opinion I've done, sir i've done three such cases now and same kind of a mobility on the table i don't think you need a plate it's unnecessary implant there number one i don't think you need any bone graft these are very good bones they are just waiting to heal you have to just keep everything there for three weeks healing is not a problem biology is not a problem in upper humerus so i use the fibula as a mechanical support more than as a biology and and okay. and an then mri the mri which is he has already what is known as a mars mri mars yeah, mri dr mukhi has already mentioned about uh, mri why he didn't do or uh, how it would have helped i think uh, due to you know I'm lack of time we'll move on to the next case now thank uh, you thank you thank dr maheshwari for an excellent uh, case and uh, we definitely we educated ourselves uh, over your case now i move on to invite uh, dr trika professor vivek trika who is the professor at the jpn apex trauma center all india institute of medical sciences to present his case dr trika please thank you dr mohanty i would like to first thank maharashtra orthopedic association bos and also doa our own doa for giving me this opportunity to be speaking on behalf of delhi orthopedic association my case is a 40 year old polytrauma case who was having fractures of his dorsal spine and his chest injuries and was in icu for a lot of time for around 2 to 3 weeks he was there his dorsal spine was fixed by the neurosurgeons and he landed up in my outdoor patient clinic after 3 months saying that he was not able to move his left shoulder when we got his x rays these were his august x rays of that year when he had the dorsal spine done where we could see that there was something wrong with the left shoulder and when he landed up with me it was in october and it three months had passed by and he was in the same thing if you see the x rays you can see that the callus has started forming on the inferior on the medial as well as the lateral part of the shaft of the humerus whenever that patient was complaining of pain on asking him repeatedly he used to say that everyone used to tell him that it's because of the dorsal spine the it was d1 d2 fracture which was operated that pain is purely because of his chest injury as well as his dorsal spine and the rib and the shoulder movements will come back nobody repeated x rays were done but nobody could get this and looked at this because no orthopedics was consulted and this many a times happens in our country that we look at a specific point do not look at the other things which also can be damaged so his dorsal spine was the main criteria and the chest injuries and the rest everything was forgot so this was a difficult situation for us a truly neglected 3 months old fracture dislocation we got his further investigations done and in the investigations on the ct scan what we found was that if you can see that this is the glenoid that there was a posterior dislocation fracture dislocation it was nearly a four part fracture the humeral head was anatomical in shape was lying on the posterior aspect of the glenoid and if you see this is the callus which was forming out here this is the callus which you can see forming all around the shaft which was even visible on the x rays 3 months old fracture dislocation four part with posterior fracture dislocation of the proximal humerus and coming to us wanting to get full or as best as possible the outcomes so we were in a tricky situation this guy was a bus driver in delhi transport corporation the dtc just like srtc's buses he was a bus driver and he wanted to go back to his profession 
as fast as possible. The options available with us were reconstruction or we replace him. He was a 40 year old man. So as Dr. Maheshwari was also saying, right now, most of the time, the proximal humerus in a young patient below 50 or 55, I would say, reconstruction is the treatment of choice, not the replacement. The problem was how to give him good results in such a case so that he can get his functional outcome back and he's able to go back to his profession. If we have to salvage it and which we thought of, what is going to be our approach? How do we reduce such a fracture which is so old? As we were discussing any augmentations which are required in such a fracture and what are the backups which can be done at this time? So the choice of treatment we opted for was the salvage of head and reconstruction as we just discussed that he was a young 40 year old man. And in these conditions, whatever may be the situation, majority of times we intend to salvage the head and reconstruct it as far as possible. The movements are the critical thing which we require out here based on his age, his profession, the fragment size, the head size appeared to be quite big enough that it will be able to hold some screws if we really want to put them. And more importantly, it's our experience with open reduction internal fixation with fracture dislocation cases that made us take this choice. This is our paper which was presented and published in Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery, where we have shown our analysis of proximal humerus fracture dislocations managed with log plates and salvage. 33 cases from 2009 to 13 managed with log plates. And we had fairly good results. We had cases which all united at the fracture site. However, there were cases which went into osteonecrosis, partial or complete, and some screw back out or perforations, but they were very minimal. The critical thing was most of them united even with the fracture dislocation cases, and they had relatively good range of motion in the post-op period. So with the backup of our experience, which we have been doing, and this treatment strategy, which is most commonly, which we need to do in a non-union or a neglected case, which is a diamond concept given by Peter Giannidis, that we require adequate stability for that fracture non-union. We require the addition of osteoconductive and osteogenetic materials, if possible, with growth factors. And once we give this a conglomerate of all these factors together, which is known as the diamond concept, then a case or a fracture healing in a non-union also is quite possible. And he has given a lot of cases and his series with this sort of strategy. So we went along with a deltopectoral approach because that's the standard approach which I use, especially in a neglected or a late case, which even if it is a posterior dislocation, what we found was a lot of callus and granulation tissue, which was expected. The first thing which we found was there was something like a lesser trochanter or lesser tuberosity, which was attached to some portion of the shaft and to other places, which we sort of osteotomized from there, tagged it and separated it so that we can get inside the joint. Then the greater tuberosity, which was found on the lower back side, was mobilized slowly by blunt dissection below the subdeltoid region. And then they were also tagged as can be seen with the 5 ethy bond out here. The critical thing now when we are able to see after debridement, a lot of the glenoid region which was found to be pristine, then we went for the posterior side because that's where the glenoid, the humeral head was lying. And by hinging our homens and putting in a shan spin on the posterior side with some problems, but with due patience, we were able to bring back the humeral head. The critical thing for us was that our humeral head was big enough and the cartilage was good that we could be able to salvage and hope for the good result. So these were his CM images, if you can see. This was the proximal humerus, which was lying on the posterior aspect with the greater tuberosity lying here, the callus can be seen. And then once we were able to reduce this humeral head, we have to make sure that it is aligned to the shaft properly. It is facing the glenoid and the greater tuberosity is below the humeral head so that the proper morphology of the humeral proximal humerus can be restored back. 
So this is the interop. Once we were able to get that, then we repositioned our greater tuberosity with the tags which we had, so that it comes below the humeral head. We required a lot of mobilization, blunt mobilization, slow mobilization of these tuberosities along with the cuff, so that we are able to bring and bring back them slowly. We also put in a fibular autograph. to give the intramedullary strut out here and the critical thing out here which we want to do is to maintain this medial hinge if we have any issues regarding maintenance of this medial hinge or the medial continuity or the shenton's line then some bone grafts or the cancellous bone grafts can also be put since it was having lot of callus we were able to put and remove those callus from the shaft and we use that granulation tissue only as the cancellous bone we did not take a specific separate cancellous bone grafts here once we were able to do that we fashioned and fixed it properly to see whether our fixation is stable enough and then subsequently a plate was put on to it making sure that we are able to get the positioning of the plate at a proper position you can see the tip of this pelos plate going right at the humeral at the point juncture where it should the calcar screws were a must big screws subchondral yes there are six or seven screws but i wanted to get as good a hold as stability as possible and also the finally the lesser tuberosity was also fixed by putting in this k wire and the screw so this is the final picture which i got this is my approach of the delto pectoral this is the plate the biceps since i was not very sure about how my bicipital groove is going to be and how the rotator interval is i tinoed is it out here normally i do not do that but in such conditions where the reduction may not be the best or a very smooth one i normally do that and i fixed all my sutures back to the tuberosity this one is the screw which is for the lesser tuberosity the golden screw which you can see a cancellous screw holding on my lesser tuberosity which was osteotomized before to gain entry and get a reasonable amount of fixation with a good alignment on the lateral view as well as on the ap view you can see that the calcar screws were going as close to it i was not much worried about the collapse because this was a very inferior part and i wanted first my in screws and my surgery to first be successful once it is successful then i can remove the screws if any time i am requiring to do that the plates were at position which was at the sub good nice position 8 cm 8 mm or so below the humeral head this is the post op film which i could get at the post op image i start my mobilization as early as possible on the very next day a passive range of pendulum exercises is started if i have got good fixation which i intend to get stability by my plate fixation and this is his range of motion of uh, 3 months you can see the scar of his delto pectoral and also his dorsal spine fracture which had been fixed this is a 6 months follow up x ray you can see that the incorporation is getting there and his range of motion has also improved and this is his final clinical image at 24 months we can see that it has fully united you can see that there is not much collapse there is amount amount of thing on the subchondral or the calcar region but he has got full range of motion full active range of motion which he is able to achieve with this and go back and get back to his profession of driving a bus which was the most sort of a very heavy profession which he wanted he has been able to go back to it right now not as a driver right now but he has gone back as a conductor inside the bus and he hopes that he is going to be getting it later so i would just end by saying that proximal humerus fracture dislocations are complex injuries but most of these young patients can achieve good functional outcome after fixation with the proper technique following the diamond concept of giving adequate stability and bringing the scaffold and the osteogenetic and other factors however you require it is proper dissection stable reconstruction and more importantly which is the early physiotherapy which will give us cornerstones to achieve a satisfactory outcome thank you very much thank you thank you dr tikhar that was an excellent case and with a uh, very good outcome because of your technique of uh, reduction and uh, fixation 
did you add any any more bone grafts in addition to fibula any other cancellous grafts yeah i did not take specifically the autogenous cancellous grafts or bone normally i take bone substitute material and do push that but here the content of the bone was okay as i showed there was a lot of callus around the humeral shaft in the proximal so while going in the dissection i had to remove that callus to get my mobility and my dissections done so that same amount of granulation tissue or the callus which you can say i use that as a bone graft didn't talk didn't take specifically if i had to get it or if i found that it was inadequate then i would have taken bone substitute material which i normally take for that along with the cancellous grafts which was already available and uh, how long did you immobilize i am fracture i normally do not immobilize any of these fractures because i rely on my initial stability of my plates and i have got a good range and i have shown you in my paper also that this is a good range which i get i initially start them with pendulum exercises on the very first or second day as soon as the pain relief is there for them then the passive range of motion is started within that time within the next 3 4 days or 5 days till 90 degrees of overhead uh, avoiding overhead activities for the next 2 to 3 weeks and then subsequently going depending upon the x rays i go upon the fixation i go upon for the further range of motion after 6 weeks active range and then muscle strengthening after 3 months okay question okay. question from dr mukhi followed by dr agrawal sure so, dr mukhi please you are unmuted sir unmute yourself dr mukhi yeah. uh, unmute i must yeah. i must congratulate you for a very excellent case presentation and performance thank you okay dr agrawal please yeah i would like to compliment you vivek it's a fantastic uh, case uh, i would do the exactly the same thing but just one question vivek i have been doing this lesser tuberosity anterior posterior screw fixations in proximal humeral fractures and in three of my cases i found that the subscapular is a very strong muscle and this screw has the screw had actually gets entangled into the subscapularis tendinous portion so when the patient is and all the actions in daily life we are doing quite a lot of strong internal rotation this screw starts backing out after few months and then on couple of occasions i had to go in and remove this screw only i mean i know in such a case uh, uh, this screw removal is not a big thing you always counsel the patient for uh, second surgery but after that i stopped doing it because i think the sutures sutures are really holding well for the uh, for the tuberosities and because biology is not a problem it's not a hemi where lesser tuberosity will not attach to the processes so i i actually stopped doing the uh, lesser tuberosity screw but yeah fantastic case vivek point well taken sir point well taken i normally do not put in the screws i mostly rely on my sutures as you saw in there yeah, yeah 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 but this was a good bone stock and i had yeah. done an osteotomy <laughs> deliberate so i wanted to yeah, get yeah. as good a fixation as possible yeah yeah i mean I, yeah this is always tempting it is right right in front of you so why not just fix yeah. it exactly <laughs> i i understand yeah thank you uh, there is a question from dr hitesh lal in a relatively less than 2 months old posterior dislocation putting a bone lever behind glenoid reduces relatively easily but how did you overcome the challenge in your case with my good experience i can say which i have presented in the shoulder elbow surgery also the journal we have done more than 50 70 cases of fracture dislocations by now this was 2013 that we had done 33 i can say that when you are reducing a neglected fracture dislocation be it posterior or anterior you need to have some patience sometimes <laughs> because you require lot of slow dissection slow mobilization and then only you will be able to achieve if you want like a true orthopedic surgeon that it comes back immediately to you it will never happen it will happen only when the bone comes to you not the soft tissues so you need to properly dissect it out you i normally put in a threaded k wire if possible or a thick k wire or a thin shan spin which is 2.5 4.5 depending depending upon the bone quality of that what i am going to do and along with my moan liver not a very it is not hinging it is just going beyond the cartilage and trying to lift it up from the posterior aspect along with that uh, another k wire which is there can add to it or if the soft tissues are there you just hold the soft tissues and slowly try to bring it out the critical thing is that all the other muscles and all the other areas 
should be also relaxed so that you have adequate space in the hip joint or, or in the shoulder joint that that a, that humeral head is able to b- go back to that area what normally happens is we try our all our stresses on bringing it back but the joint cavity is totally closed and then whatever you do it will not do the same thing happens in a talus fracture dislocation that we are not able to bring it back because of the strong tendon achilles so my shoulder is always flexed a lot my elbow is always flexed so that all the biceps and everything are getting relaxed in an anterior dislocation i am able to relax the coracoid muscles and then bring it back and the same way for the posterior part going in extension slightly relieved re- relaxing the muscles giving traction to the humeral shaft and then making sure that the space is there. okay dr sarad agrawal uh, uh, tells that with extensive dissection there is an increased chances of avn so the dissection is not being done around the vascular area of your humeral shaft and those areas here you have to get the dissection because it is a neglected fracture and until unless you mobilize it let's say it was an anterior dislocation which we also do which is going way beyond the coracoid you are just next to the brachial plexus and the vessels so you need to be a proper meticulous i'm not saying extensive dissection it has to be a meticulous maintaining the soft tissue positions while remaining away from the vital structures also so it's not a massive like a sarcomatous changes or any oncology surgery okay dr maheshwari is Uh, raised one, one tip, Vivek, uh, uh, you are an experienced, very, very uh, kind of pro- prolific surgeon. But if if it is an old case particularly, and sometimes even in new cases, it's very difficult to get that head back from delto-pectoral approach because it's all the way behind. So I think one tip I would like to give, which I've done in a, quite a few of these neglected posterior ones, make a posterior incision. vertical incision. The yeah. way you do deltoid split in the front, carefully marking your uh, axillary you can split it there also just put your finger behind yes. and with a finger and something from the front just manipulate everything sometime it is very hard to take it from front you can damage the cartilage you can damage the gt so i think that's a very important trip also i agree to the user completely i norm- i always have a backup of that and i have done it i have some cases also where i've done a second incision or the mid deltoid or a posterior deltoid area just to have a slightly more area for mobilizing it properly and yeah. li- getting back the thing i normally use the delto pectoral because i am very comfortable doing it and in especially in such a four part i would prefer to do it this way but i normally uh, use i take your tip very yeah. easy dr dr raman agarwal yes yeah so it's just that uh, very rightly said that you don't bring the head to the gla- uh, to the shaft take the shaft to the head by ab ducting externally yes. rotating and yes. you get there second thing to answer dr uh, hitesh lal's question and dr sharad agarwal's question when we are doing this surgery we are usually pushed by the constraint of the soft tissues and chronicity of the lesion on the superior quarter of the glenoid and the head actually is sitting inferior so when we are exposing we need to hit the inferior sector of the glenoid we need to uh, debride there take Bring the granulation back. out from there Yeah. then gently take a curved osteotome go along the posterior glenoid and by levering it a little bit see whether the head is united to this scapula or not if the head is not united to this scapula you can be very careful and try to tease the head out by gradually gradually but if the head is united to this scapula don't fret then you have lost it you can't reconstruct we take a hemi and keep it on shelf in such cases keeping the hemi on shelf is very important because if you are if you are finding that the head is uh, united to the scapula you can't take it out in one piece it has to be a piece made so uh, just to take that yeah. uh, at that point of time having a hemi in the ot can uh, bail you up yeah i agree yes. to that and say that whenever you are doing a fracture dislocation cases yeah get Is a ct it? one day before or two days before so that you know <laughs> how the head is at yeah. that day Not, not a not a neglected one, one. exactly yeah, not a four weeks ago or three weeks ago and yeah, because yeah. it can have a hill sack sort of a lesion inside the area cancellous yeah. and the yeah. second thing is always have a backup of a replacement if possible there is a question from dr samarjit singh do you do coracoid osteotomy for such cases any time so that is a prescribed thing which you can use but in my experience over the last for the 70 80 cases which i have done out till now 
I've never used it for a quite osteotomy, but it's never say never for in orthopedics. The thing to do is you can also get the same coracoid relaxation. What you are doing is by getting the shoulder inflection and elbow inflection and mild abduction if you want in the for the deltoid. So if you want, you can relax the muscles which are coming like biceps and coracobrachialis by doing the same thing. But if you want it, you can definitely do a coracoid osteotomy and get the in, in anterior dislocation. This was a posterior one, so not required. And uh, Dr. Sota uh, tells that sometimes doing bicep stenotomy also helps in the redu reduction. Yeah, I, if you say, oh, I have, we have done that, but I normally try to maintain it till the end if possible, so that it gives me a direction of my orientation of my humeral head to the shaft. And if later on I feel that my rotator interval has not become a proper smooth one or it can cause some issues, then I do the tenotomies and tenodes them. Yeah, Dr. Raman Agarwal feels that uh, coracoid osteotomy for anterior dislocation is sure, but not for posterior. Yeah, that's what I... Yeah. yeah, and I have also one normal thing. There are going to be biceps. The biceps can be a very severe cause of pain because biceps, the course of biceps is very convoluted. Biceps goes onto the arm and then it turns externally 10 degrees and then it turns back medially. So I, uh, as a precaution, I kill the biceps every time I do a proximal humeral surgery. Honestly, <laughs> I am a biceps killer. Yep. Okay. okay, Dr. Hiteslal feels that he prefers a lesser tuberosity osteotomy in neglected three-part fracture dislocation or soft tissue release for bone-to-bone -bone healing. What is your comment about it? In a three-part one, in which it is a GT and a head with a lesser trochanter, then it might be difficult because it's already gone inside and it is lying subcoracoid or medial to the coracoid. That's why I, I did this. Because I normally prefer not to do these until unless I am able not to get inside the humeral head or in the humeral joint. And it will convert it into four part as well. Yeah. Well, well, thank you very much, Dr. Trika, for a wonderful thank presentation. You. And it was so interesting that it lasted almost for 25 minutes. And thanks oh, for giving <laughs> the diamond, diamond concept also. And we thank Dr. Mahachuri also for introducing us the tent or tambu concept. Well, I now invite the next speaker, uh, Dr. Raman Kant Agrawal, who is a director of shoulder and upper limb surgery in Medanta, the Medicity. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shinde. Thank you so much for this opportunity to BOA, MOA, and DOA. So, uh, I don't have much to speak because of my previous two excellent knowledgeable speakers. My job is very less now. The message is very clear, reconstruct, reconstruct, reconstruct. So this is a seven weeks neglected lateral four part fracture dislocation in a 40 years young man who when he sustained seven weeks ago was taken up by somebody for this. And it is a true lateral dislocation uh, sort of uh, slightly posterior, but actually more lateral on the shaft of the humerus. And if you can see my cursor, I can see that head is not completely spherical. It has lost some bone, some volume. I can see the typical appearance of the top of the greater tuberosity and some part of head on that with a double shadow there. I can place the lesser tuberosity there. So practically speaking, I didn't need any, because the patient is young, it is seven weeks, the previous surgeon neglected the injury. This is a true neglect. It's not a missed injury, it's a true neglect. The surgeon recognized the fracture dislocation, tried to go in, went in and did something which is not still acceptable. He could not restore the anatomy, which is my only goal. That is how I consent my patient that I'm going to restore the anatomy to the best of my ability and the function will ensue with your participation. That's my standard consent. Now, I didn't need a CT for this and the patient also had an axillary nerve palsy and because the patient had brought the CT with him, so this is the picture I got on the CT. Couple of more pictures on the CT which showed me that there is a greater tuberosity. Some part of the head looks like a Shebel's type one to me the head is 
dislocated posteriorly, and I could see some bone lying inferior medially. That was the clinical picture of the patient. I could see the deltoid atrophied squaring of the acromion is happening. I can still see one K wire in situ, and the incision is not actually deltopectoral, it is actually pectoral. So that was the clinical presentation seven weeks down the line when the patient came to me. So I decided first to do the inflammatory markers because of the previous surgery. I decided to do an NCV and EMG, which showed that the nerve is recovering. Patient already had a CT scan. I would have had the CT scan for associated injuries to see the glenoid, to see anything else going on in the scapula, and not only proximal humerus, but for the humerus, the decision was made on AP X-ray itself. Counseling of the patient regarding AVN, which is a must in this patient, nerve injury, second surgery, and even need for further revision if something happens. Now, going back to these fractures, I would like to say this is an extreme end of valgus fracture. It is actually equivalent to, she, to uh, Robinson's type 3. It is a very good article by Robinson in 2010, General of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery, where he explains how the valgus fractures happen. And in 3C, the head of the humerus accompanies the shaft and it becomes an anterior fracture dislocation like picture. And in this case, the head, if you could see my cursor, the valgus forces brings up medially directing head to superiorly directing head to laterally directing head, eventually completely dislocating the head from the glenoid. So having decided the principles of management, I also decided about open reduction internal fixation with fibular strut grafting, plus minus bone substitute and hemi on the table. This is the intra picture. The head end is this side. This is the foot end. This is the greater tuberosity tag mobilized. This is the head. You can see the articular surface there over my Colbell's retractor, my suction tip and a home end. Uh, and the arm is in complete abduction at this moment to relax the posterior deltoid muscles. This is what it was. There is no way I can do anything else. There is no soft tissue attachment. And that is how the head looked. And you can appreciate that there is a bone loss of the head there. And I believe, and just because of this bone loss and looking at the pre-op CT, I knew that this is a part which is going around the bicipital groove. But even if I didn't know, I didn't have a choice. It becomes a dial-in kind of a head in a hemiarthroplasty. It's spherical, it's circular. Wherever you rotate it, you keep it, it is going to stay there. So you can appreciate this is the fibula, which is approximately one and a half inch inside the humeral shaft and one and a half inch up, one inch up. And this is the greater tuberosity. And this is the lesser tuberosity suture. And that's the biceps tendon, which I always take off. And now I tried fixing this head over the whatever is there, and you can see the void of bone. But remind, reminding you, this area is going to be filled in by the greater tuberosity, and this area is going to be filled in by the lesser tuberosity eventually. So this is the shaft, that's the fibula going in, and that's the head, like a hat on the hook in a valgus impacted fracture. And that's the biceps tendon. I fix the, just next to the bicep, lateral to the bicep tendon. My K wires go not from lateral to medial. They always go from the bicepital groove, impinging the shield fragment, just lateral to the bicep tendon, going from the shaft to the head. And that is how it looked into the C arm. And one of the wire also caught the intramedullary fibular graft. Having accepted this position, I know this is, doesn't look ideal. It is still not looking medially, but maybe I've converted it from a stage 3C to maybe stage 1 or 2. 
and stage two is when the humeral head and shaft uh, they dissociate but in maybe stage one but in this case as you see i was able to restore the medial metaphyseal calcar region and also maintain the gothic arch so i accepted this position went in and that is how it looked i know that because of the pull of the sutures on the greater tuberosity and after the extensive release mm -hmm. and i have found this situation very commonly and maybe there is a component of some hill sex kind of a compression defect into the head but i accept it because the head is still higher than the tuberosity and tuberosity was lying down and this appeared to be a good reconstitution and my two screws catching the fibular graft so if we are putting the fibular graft it is imperative that both at least two screws should go through the fibular graft otherwise it will not be a stable construct this was his x-ray at three months so it looks like and i know because in the ap view i kept the screw short i know because it is going to land in avn for sure and one of these screws is definitely going to protrude at the end of the day but doesn't look that bad in the axillary view where the screws are fanning all around and are still subchondral this is the screw which is reaching the articular surface i really don't mind my calcar screws to go through the head of the humerus because in any position of the shoulder they will never be eroding the glenoid but the most superior screw in the a hole of the pelos will produce the most damage so i'm very careful in my my screws goes from from top to bottom the shortest to longest like this and here even if it is protrudes there it's not a big concern but any of these screws above the e hole if they protrude will damage the glenoid this was the clinical appearance at 3 months his deltoid is also recovering and he is attained the rounded contour of the deltoid and that was his external rotation at 6 months that was his elevation at 6 months and that that is his elevation at 1 year and mind it i have removed the implant at 10 months implant removal i have to do at i have done that in 10 months time because one of the screws was perforating and i removed the implant i was very watchful of that so my take home message is our lateral fracture dislocation is a very rare injury and it represents the severest form of valgus fractures please don't throw the head into the bin however small in the young patients even if avn is unavoidable displaced tuberosities heal well to the shaft <coughs> and to the graft and to the head and not so well to the metal processes struck graft is a must to prevent collapse persistence in rehabilitation is essential even beyond 6 months be ready for implant removal as soon as we spot screw penetration usually at 8 to 12 months thank you thank you thank you dr agrawal for an excellent uh, case very difficult case and with a reasonable very good outcome now any questions on this uh, there are a question uh, in the youtube uh, i am dr sasang mishra that uh, i am clueless if it was intact soft tissue envelope it would have made sense what is your uh, sorry what is the question if it was intact soft tissue envelope it would have made sense to reduce this fracture i didn't get the question fully but if the uh, dr mishra is asking why did i use a completely devoid head is that the question yeah dr. yeah most of that question yeah. was for dr trikha and because you asked around some 20 minutes ago okay okay yeah that's fine okay right fine uh, and now there, there is a comment from uh, dr ravi sautha that avn is probably inevitable so the young reconstruction was the answer and what you have done for the hill sex that is his question oh there is no hill sex it is not a anterior dislocation this is a lateral dislocation and this is a valgus this is the extreme form of valgus impacted fractures in the humerus um, and the the way is the head of the humerus looks medially and posteriorly and when in abduction axial force the head of the humerus always goes posteriorly medially posteriorly and inferiorly so with internal rotation abduction internal rotation 
especially in push the head of the humerus is looking again more posteriorly so it depends what is the force at that point of time there is no point of hill sacs uh, in this the head of the humerus starts breaking at the anatomical neck at the ring of the greater and lesser tuberosities where the shield fragment is yes dr rosota my question is if there is a hill sac what do you do for that in these injuries there is no hill not sac. in this if there is anterior, in, in in anterior fracture dislocations anterior okay. or even the posterior okay. fracture anterior fracture dislocation of oh, for the posterior river uh, in the posterior What's river it? reverse hill sacs i'll do a mclaughlin provided my shoulder is my shoulder is uh, unstable uh, beyond my, my forearm on the tummy so if the reverse hill sacs is big i will do a mclaughlin procedure or do an autograph in the humeral head for anterior fracture dislocations because the uh, hill sacs i have not done anything for the hill sacs but if there is a glenoid problem i have done a letter j along with the uh, open reduction internal fixation of anterior fracture dislocation these patients are probably never going to achieve that much external rotation in abduction to address the hill sacs for the lateral there is no hill sacs there is a question from dr sarad agarwal do you have the final x ray after removal of the implant i have it sir but actually what happened was my original laptop which all has data i ran out of my charger it broke so i am doing uh, this presentation okay. on a makeshift as soon as i get this i will i will yeah, share yeah. with with everybody yes i have well dr tatakar wants to ask a question yeah dr tatakar you are mm -hmm. unmute yeah go ahead go can ahead. you can you hear me yeah, sure. i can hear you dr tatakar yeah. yeah yeah see to all the three presenters in all of these three cases i think excellent cases presented there was a definite risk of avn so instead of using a non vascularized fibula is there any role of using a vascularized fibula number 1 and number 2 because the rotator cuff is already contracted in most of these cases immobilization post operatively if you immobilize in little abduction and external rotation will it make difference in the healing of the soft tissues so uh, to answer your question dr kakkar the yeah. as far as the vascularized fibula is concerned now these fractures unite at between 2 to 4 months and avn as far as avn is concerned avn doesn't cause much problem the uh, positive predictive value of all these tests of uh, part 4 uh, fracture dislocation is around 97% and in such a case avn is the eventual outcome for sure the idea is to use the head instead of the uh, metal prosthesis using it as a hemi arthro biological hemi arthroplasty my aim is to get the tuberosities to heal to the shaft so that the rotator cuff biomechanics can restore the normal joint and if i need to do a hemi later on after healing of the tuberosities i will give 20 years to the patient but if i go for something else uh, i will not be able to give 20 years to the patient as far as vascularized fibula is concerned that's too much of a lengthy job and plastic surgeons will actually take all the money there i don't see any advantage uh, in getting the plastic surgeons into the vascularized fibula in this the natural fibula does a wonderful job by our previous experience and it takes avian and at 9 months or 12 months the actually i have got another patient with a natural fibula actually incorporates and a funnel shape uh, of the proximal humerus is achieved devoid of the head and when there is no head patient is still maintaining very good function for last 9 years actually the avian only happens in uh, one in four avians are symptomatic three out of four avians are not symptomatic so i don't see any point for going for a vascularized fibula as far as the position of immobilization is concerned i do maintain all the patients in neutral wedge brace i don't give an abduction brace but i do give a neutral wedge brace so that the forearm is not resting on the tummy in a natural sling like in a natural sling but is actually maintaining in the normal anatomical position when we stand so the neutral brace is a must yes i think well uh, there is a question from Dr. Hitesh Lal, 
yes, uh, very nice presentation. Uh, one question: Sometimes in old three-part neglected uh, fracture dislocations, even after accomplishing a good reduction by surgery, uh, the head dislocates after a slight rotation. So, have you added any Bristow type procedure in these cases, or you leave them as such? I have answered this question. Uh, when I'm doing a neglected anterior fracture dislocation, the first step is a coracoid osteotomy. When I do a coracoid osteotomy, I do go back and look at the CT scan to look at the glenoid and face view and the axillary cut of the glenoid, that whether I need to do something for the glenoid or not. If there is a bony component of the glenoid, I, I will do a lateral J, and then I will cut the, my coracoid for two centimeters from the tip to effect a proper lateral J. If I do not find any defect into the glenoid, I will not do anything, but I will just cut the coracoid osteotomy maybe one centimeter from the tip uh, with a pre-drilled screw into that at the end of the procedure. Uh, but no, I don't do anything. The soft tissues are not there at that point of time because the way I reduce the humeral head anteriorly dislocated is I go be between the glenoid and the humeral head. I do not go over the substrate because I don't want to cut the substrate at all. So I go between the glenoid and the humeral head and I tease it out. And as soon as I externally rotate the humeral, internally rotate the humeral head, I'm able to bring the humeral head along with an attached substrate to the glenoid cavity. So no, I don't do anything additional <coughs> procedure unless the glenoid is damaged itself. There's one question from Dr. Sasang Misra on YouTube. The question is that uh, as the head is at 130 degrees to the soft, why would fibula hold up the head? Sorry, I didn't get the question. If the head is 130 degrees? Head is at 130 degrees to the shaft. Yeah. Why would fibula hold up the head? The fibula will still hold the head because what I do is, uh, when I'm doing the uh, my imaging, the intra-op imaging, I am I'm looking at the uh, head neck shaft angle and I'm also looking at the uh, sphericity of the head by rotating it, by fixing it with the wires. And one of the wires is going through the fibular head. So it holds, uh, the wires are holding, and when I'm putting these screws, then screws are holding. So, and when you find the true position of the head over the fibula, then you just create a little bit of uh, dent into the subcontral bone there and put the fibula there, so that head stays there. Right. Okay, one Thank last you. question from Dr. Maheshwari, then we move on to the next question. I think, uh, I'm, I'm quite amazed that uh, Dr. Raman didn't replace it, knowing him, as a big replacement guy, but I'm quite impressed with your zeal to save the head. And this case actually shows it very clearly that even when the head was in your head, hand outside, you could still manage to put it back. And actually that is a better policy than replacing with a hemi because to get the rotator cuff feel to hemi is nearly impossible. In this case, even if AVN happens tomorrow, the result of hemi will be much better then if you do a primary hemi because rotator cuff will not heal to primary hemi. So I think in a young person to jump on to doing hemi arthroplasty is a very wrong decision. The only arthroplasty that works in upper humerus fractures, if at all, is reverse in elderly people, which you can't do in young people. So I think in young people preserving the head, and this is an extreme example where honestly speaking, sometime even I would have done a hemi. But I'm quite convinced with your approach that get the rotator cuff heal. And AVN may not matter. If it does matter, any arthroplasty. Absolutely, Dr. Meshri. I've got three patients like this where I, the head was in my hand. Uh, but I also are doing well. well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Now we'll move to the next speaker, Dr. V. Sautai, who is a director and HOD at the Artemis Hospital. And uh, he'll be talking on the neglect injuries. Dr. Sautai, please. So uh, you are able to see my screen? Yes, yes, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is a 48-year-old uh, uh, post-trauma presented to me after 10 months uh, of the previous injury, where uh, he had a history of fall. There was a severe pain and a swelling around the shoulder, for which uh, he was... Uh, so, X-ray was done, which was reported there is no bony injury. Paul Chancellor, six, eight weeks, physiotherapy after that. Eight months, he kept on doing physiotherapy. And there was uh, uh, abduction, axial rotation restriction and uh, active flexion was only possible till uh, 90 degrees of uh, the movement. And this is the x-ray which uh, showed, uh, which was taken 
almost a whole arm and the uh, shoulder uh, includes including the elbow uh, was taken up so uh, uh, further x ray uh, study was done uh, axial so some something uh, it looks that probably uh, there is uh, something wrong in this area but uh, still we can't make uh, too much of uh, it so when uh, patient was uh, uh, came to us uh, after post traumatic stiffness uh, he was treated for uh, frozen, uh, before a uh, patient came to us he was treated with the uh, post traumatic shoulder stiffness frozen shoulder uh, about 3 uh, months of physiotherapy about 5 months later from the index surgery his intraarticular injection was given shoulder manipulation under anesthesia was done and uh, and still patient presented to us in this position this was his uh, clinical picture uh, if uh, uh, somebody wants to comment on this basically uh, there is a, a abduct there is a flexion which is possible up to uh, about 90 degrees uh, barely and there is a internal rotation attitude if you see the palm is almost facing medially dr raman if you want to say anything at this point now well, i mean this is clearly i mean even in the x ray ap view it's an empty glenoid in the true ap view and uh, and this is of course looks like a posterior missed posterior dislocation to me so uh, as uh, emphasized previously by different uh, uh, speakers so far that uh, doing x ray in a proper position and a different views which are very important and this is exactly a, a classical uh, what they call a light bulb uh, appearance uh, which is uh, can also be uh if seen in uh, uh, in this there is another sign which is known as uh, through line uh, sign uh, in the uh, shoulder x ray uh, which is in the normal ap view which can be seen so a uh, ct scan was uh, considered uh, and evaluated uh, one can see that uh, there is uh, there is a some amount of irregularity at the at the articular surface and uh, and and uh, one can see that uh, there is a definitive uh, uh, in a coronal plane also and in a, a horizontal plane there are uh, uh, there is a comminution in this area so uh, and and if you look closely on the articular surface there is a reasonable amount of a step uh, partly shoulder is locked uh, posteriorly and this is a part of the head uh, which is uh, locked posteriorly into the uh, scapular uh, uh, glenoid so uh, any thoughts uh, dr raman um, what to do well it's, uh, <clears throat> it's kind of a, a splayed yeah, head so, so so to me it appears that there is a there was a fracture in the proximal humerus which is this line is depicting and uh, there was a fracture intra which was extending intraarticularly part of it was uh, had a dislocation so it was a posterior fracture dislocation which uh, was uh, there uh, so uh, so any uh, so at, at the moment basically when we look at it it is a neglected posterior fracture dislocation uh, which presents with painful restriction of a, a shoulder joint movement well one very uh, the, in the initial x ray we can't see this particular fracture but seen in this later x ray so can it be due to the one of the manipulations which was done we got a sort of spiral fracture which has gone down uh, yeah. not really because uh, patient uh, with this x ray still presents uh, to us with the uh, range of motion which is markedly restricted arm is still in the internal rotation attitude and uh, there is a flexion in uh, uh, only full internal rotation dr raman any thoughts about the treatment plan well i mean i'll i'll be i'll be uh, aiming for an open luxation and mclaughlin but i will have this uh, uh, hemi on the shelf because most probably if the head contour and the circumference of the head is not in line with what i think then probably i'll have to put a hemi but otherwise if i'm able to play the head out a little bit then probably mclaughlin uh, would be uh, my procedure of choice so uh, role of uh, close reduction manipulation is out uh, close reduction for dislocation is out dr raman believes that uh, open reduction and mclaughlin would be the probably answer 
and uh, hemi arthroplasty yes some uh, something uh, uh, should be ready or a surface replacement arthroplasty or reverse shoulder so these are the options probably and uh, we know that uh, there is uh, enough literature which talks about uh, uh, doing uh, this type of a procedure in which uh, these are a classical presentation in which mclaughlin uh, procedure is done so in our case this was the uh, presentation we approached it uh, through deltopectoral bicep stenotomy and uh, uh, then uh, articular surface when you look at the articular surface uh, where my cursor is there is a huge step here however the fracture uh, is healed completely there is no movement in the fractured fragment which was uh, extending into the metaphyseal area any thoughts uh, further doctor uh, any, anybody can take up uh, the case at this point where is the subscap uh, subscapular uh, was uh, 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 you know um, uh, dissected out from here uh, you know lifted off uh, from from this uh, so 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 now the question is when you were trying to do a reduction you had already decided now this procedure needs to be already decided whether i am going to do a mclaughlin or not if you're not decided then you may regret it later on in the next step so if we are decided that we are going to do a methylophlin then we will do a lesser tuber osteo osteotomy yeah but if we are not decided that i am going to do a methylophlin and then i am going to cut the subscap then how would we do the methylophlin later on yeah that is true but the but when you look at the uh, articular surface and the cartilage which looks very badly damaged in this situation uh, uh, leaving it uh, after doing a methylophlin and plus the if you look at the look at the articular strap step it is superior it is not anterior generally for a for a classical fracture uh, posterior uh, defect or a reverse hill sex you would see in this area not not superior on the articular surface so uh, doing a mclaughlin in this procedure this particular uh, type of a shoulder no 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 i am not saying that no but oh, the only thing is i don't know in what what angle it appears it looks like a head looks like a, probably a gt is that you saying if that is a gt where is the cuff uh, so this is the this is the part of the head whole whole portion is a part of the head it is not a gt okay the part of the head and it is the intra articular component which is here there is a step into the articular surface all right okay yeah, dr patnaik uh, has also commented that it is a head split fracture yeah so what one, one could see it uh, clearly on the on the x ray uh, mm -hmm. where uh, x ray was extending right uh, into that uh, area yeah 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 so uh, what we did uh, we took this uh, uh, particular implant where only head uh, surface re uh, replacement was done for the uh for the head which was uh, affected completely and uh, and in this particular case after uh, leaving it in uh, uh gunsling brace for about 6 8 weeks and gradual mobilization at 6 to 8 weeks uh, this was the previous x ray and this was uh, the uh, present clinical picture and uh, in this particular case Uh, why we chose uh, arthro uh, hemi arthroplast uh, uh, surface arthroplasty to uh, reconstruction because it was a long standing there was a head split uh, step at the articular surface cartilage was very badly damaged and uh, uh, fracture proximal humerus had already united and uh, obviously it remained uh, in a subluxated position posteriorly uh, uh, repeatedly so uh, this is uh, 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 this is uh, what we did and uh, we have another case uh, this is a uh, 78 for this case dr smarjit patnaik has commented that intraarticular osteotomy with osteosynthesis by headless screws and he may require buttress plate that is his comment in take on uh, that with the cartilage which is completely damaged uh, and uh, had reasonably widened and extraarticular component of the fracture completely healed i believe doing that would be a little uh, too extensive a procedure uh, to to what uh, uh, we thought was a simpler and easier procedure where uh, you know articular cartilage is uh, completely uh, damaged uh, dr raman khan tagarwal has commented this is not a surface replacement it is a mid head or hemi arthroplasty yeah mid head uh, hemi arthroplasty right yeah yeah you can go to next step yeah next next okay. case now yeah. so this is a 98 year male with a fracture dislocation who presented one and a half month later for whatever reasons 
uh, was uh, being treated uh, uh, in the periphery. Any comment, uh, Dr. Raman Khan? Well, I don't know. Oh, that's again a, looks like a, a posterior. I don't know, anterior or posterior? It is a posterior. Posterior, okay. I can see the corticoid. It is a posterior uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the MRI and the CT scan uh, shows uh, the superior portion is the anterior part. And uh, I think do what Vivek has told you in the morning. Yeah. And it doesn't look united as well. But she's 70 something. Yeah, he's 70. Okay. Even then. So this is the <laughs> Yeah, big metaphysical fragment is there. Big metaphysical component here. Uh, any plan for uh, approach uh, any specific uh, indication for the special approach which uh, was discussed earlier, anterolateral or uh, uh, deltopectoral? Any well, preference? I am I am diehard Delta Pectoral man. <laughs> Me too. As Dr. Uh, Tirka was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the surgeons, I think, uh, they're well acquainted with Delta Pectoral approach, and uh, that becomes a little easier to delineate the anatomy. So, is there a role for uh, for uh, uh, fixation uh, in this particular case, uh, or uh, one should think of a reverse shoulder? Uh, I'll decide on the table. Having everything on board. Okay. So you will keep everything uh, and be on the table. So we know that uh, both things are possible. These are the cases from the literature where there was a head split which was very short and small. Uh, hemi replacement was done on, uh, reverse shoulder was done on one side and uh, other side it was preserved because the patient presented with bilateral uh, post seizure uh, dislocation. And uh, in our case, uh, we also used uh, uh, delta pectoral approach. Uh, we did uh, uh, the uh, approach, uh, did the biceps tenotomy, as uh, Dr. Tirka pointed out, that uh, a threaded shan spin, uh, gradual manipulation, a lot of patients to uh, deliver the head. It is, it is a very uh, uh, gradual patient's delivery of the head from the posterior uh, displaced position. And the most important is uh, that uh, we have to be very, very gentle because sometimes, as I believe that this is a big metaphysical piece and uh, uh, there may be a capsular attachment or a soft tissue attachment which would still be uh, there in this particular uh, situ uh, particular uh, condition which, which we do expect and uh, uh, then uh, delivery, after the delivery of the head into this, uh, we are... Uh, because the uh, it was uh, uh, difficult to reconstruct the complete anatomy and maintain the calcar portion or uh, reconstruct the calcar area and uh, give the adequate height to the head uh, the reconstruction with the help of uh, uh, fibular strut was considered uh, once the strut uh, was put in and the fixation was achieved uh, so uh, and uh, then we realized that uh, that uh, shoulder was only stable in about 60 to 70 degrees of external rotation. Any thoughts, Dr. Raman, at this point? Oh, you mean the shoulder was unstable in a deduction at 70 degrees? It was unstable when we it was put in neutral. It would dislocate posteriorly. And when we okay. rotated it into external rotation at 60 to 70 degrees, okay. then only it remained stable into the glenoid. So I don't think the defect was too large. Uh, was it too large? Yeah, it was actually. Can you, can, can you go back to the... This seat? was the defect. Can, can you, you see this big large no, defect? No, I mean, it won't give me an idea how big it was. Was it 50% of the head? I'll still go ahead and do a McLaughlin in this if it was less than 50% of the head by CISA classification. Between uh, 25 to 50, I'll do a McLaughlin. Beyond that, I'll do an autograft or I can take 70. an autograft and do an autograft right now. At this point of a time, it is 60 to 70 degrees. No, no. That is external rotation. What I'm saying is if the head defect is between 25 to 50 degrees of the volume of the head, 
yeah. then i will do a mclaughlin if it is or or maybe an autograph and beyond uh, 60% probably you will do a hemi arthroplasty or reverse but if the defect is between 25 to 50% of the head uh, mclaughlin or an autograph will be at this stage uh, i will take an autograph and put it there there is a suggestion from dr smarajit patnaik that a stage 1 bone stock maintained by osteosynthesis and next is prosthetic replacement if general condition and comorbidity is allowed yeah i think so that was a, a perfect uh, point which we uh, did take so uh, this was uh, what we did because it is remained unstable Uh, uh as soon as we would put it in a neutral position it would actually dislocate posteriorly every time mm-hmm. so what we had to do is a uh, uh, osteotomy this was the fracture fracture site just below the fracture uh, in the uh, metadiaphyseal area we did a derotation osteotomy and uh, then after that uh, the head was uh, found uh, to be very stable in the position and uh, we could actually maintain the reduction and uh, how did you immobilize this in the neutral and position this was kept in a sling okay and at 3 months any thoughts dr raman i will not do an osteotomy i will take a graft from the iliac crest and do an autograft there uh it, it 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 remained unstable constantly for whatever uh, after the autograft after mm-hmm. you fill the reverse hill sac it will not be unstable but then you had to maintain the reduction at this point of time you had to come out so your plate is sitting laterally not anteriorly the defect is anteriorly no no not the question question is that the shoulder was unstable i agree the shoulder is unstable because the hill, reverse hill sac defect is so large that as soon as you cross the midline of the body it falls into the reverse hill sacs and yes. that is one of the criteria whether to do a mclaughlin or not so what i do is i check on the table so i check if the if the if i take the patient i keep the patient's forearm on the tummy and it is stable leave it it's not going to go anywhere it but if it is, i understand so if that is such a big defect of 60 to 70 degrees external rotation it requires to be in the neutral and stable i i think this is too much for an osteotomy to handle i will take an autograft from the iliac crest put Mama the defect graft into the reverse hill sacs fix it with screws and come out well, dr hitesh dr hitesh lal also is commenting the same thing that mclaughlin or the graft would have worked works well in neglected old posterior dislocation to fill reverse hill sacs and open reduction should be tried till 6 months so okay. uh, but uh, the fact remained that uh, because uh, we could not keep it in a neutral position uh, as soon as we would bring it in a neutral position it would dislocate posteriorly i did not realize what was the cause i i am sure it was not only the hill sac there was prob- exactly uh, whether the posterior dislocation was because of the rotated proximal uh, head you can say possibly, head possibly. or because of the uh, anterior hill sacs yeah possible the cause of the dislocation possibly so so the, the uh, on table i had no other option but to uh, uh, because uh, before hand also patient did not uh, was not in uh, socio economically affording the uh, replacement there is no reverse shoulder replacement which is available uh, which is cheaper and we also proximal humerus bone stock was uh, you know need, needed to be built up and uh, uh, so in this uh, low demand elderly patient uh, we uh, we did uh, Uh, thought of uh, doing the derotation and uh, because of a lockdown this is a recent uh, x ray assisted uh, video which patient sent uh, so uh, looking at you know, because summary is case sir yeah traumatic yeah. posterior dislocation uh, with with large reverse hill sac uh, derotation osteotomy was the only option which uh, i thought of on the table uh with the and uh, with the reasonably big metaphyseal peak where the soft tissue capsule was attached i believe that uh, avn we should be able to uh you know be uh, off avn and uh, hopefully if uh, he, he he does not have a rotator cuff effective rotator cuff and a good function at later later date after the bone stock is restored he may require a replacement 
थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू थैंक यू डॉक्टर सौता फॉर एन एक्सलेंट प्रेजेंटेशन मैं रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर काकटकर टू पुट अप हिज स्लाइड्स इन द मिन टाइम मे आस्क ए क्वेश्चन दैट व्हाट इज द रोल ऑफ हेमी ऑर्थोप्लास्टी टुडे इन दिस फोर पार्ट फ्रैक्चर डिसलोकेशन और फोर पार्ट फ्रैक्चर ह्यूमरस एनी ऑफ द फैकल्टी कैन यू नो कैन सजेस्ट role of uh, hemi arthroplasty role of uh, you know so, hemi head replacement which uh, dr sautha just uh, showed here or a, a reverse shoulder in a fractured case in a four part fracture uh, i don't think there is a role of a stemless kind of thing ravi's case was a different thing because the greater tuberosity was attached uh, uh, so it is a stemless procedure he done but in all other cases it will have to be a stemmed processes a trauma stem which will take the tuberosities if you are doing a hemi arthroplasty uh, i certainly don't want to give this message that you can get away with a stemless prosthesis in a trauma situation no it is a different situation just a fracture so in a trauma situation we need to have a stemmed prosthesis and that too which has got provision for attaching the tuberosities onto it uh, and pre preferably a coated one uh, as far as the indications indications will still remain that in a situation i i had a patient exactly the same patient who had posterior fracture dislocations just before the lockdown i did a fixation on the left side but i had to do a hemi on the right side because it was no way the head was a very small and there was no way i could reconstruct the way i had re reconstructed previously so uh, yes hemi arthroplasty has got a role uh, in the youngish population where you think you cannot save the head by any means and cannot come out of the ot as a salvage procedure only but beyond 65 or 60 or in a 70 years old patient i will not hesitate to straight away go for a reverse because that will give me one shot surgery and and predictable result thank you thank, thank you, you thank you dr agrawal now let me have the honor of inviting dr vijay kakatkar who is very senior orthopedic surgeon that well experienced more than 40 years uh, He is the past president of uh, Maharashtra Orthopedic Association and uh, very well respected uh, in the you know in orthopedics community. Dr. Kakatkar, sir, please uh, go ahead with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, see, first of all, uh, thank you, Dr. Mohanty, Dr. Shinde, and Dr. Karne. to ask me to participate into this particular webinar and this is my first case this is a 61 year female with a injury 8 months old to her proximal humerus the history was that she was treated by some orthopedic surgeon by some kyrs which were kept for about 6 weeks and because there was some low grade infection the wires were removed and then she was just left like that so by the time she came to me it was already an 8 months old injury and this was the x ray the previous x rays were not available with her this was the position in which she came to me there was a clear cut absorption of the bone ends with all rounding up and we could see that it's a classical non union she had some associated comorbidities she was uncontrolled diabetic for last more than 10 years for last 10 years hypertension on medication and as the x ray was very clearly showing she was having severe osteoporosis we did her bone density and the oh. t score was minus 3.517 indicating that yes there was a lot of osteoporosis as one of the major issues mm -hmm. for treating this was an x-ray taken in abduction we showed that there was a very frank mobility and the same was confirmed on the image intensifier so after controlling her comorbidities we decided to go ahead and do the osteosynthesis of this particular patient the other options that we had to think of was whether we can do a replacement or a reverse shoulder because the muscles were quite badly wasted but then looking at uh, the overall vascularity of the head we decided to go for osteosynthesis and kept ready for 
fibula as well as the iliac crest bone graft and the bone substitutes if required and this was what the surgery was done we put a fibular strut and that was showed in and the head in such a way that we could get correction of the position of the head and uh, additional gap which was there around the fibula was filled up with iliac crest uh, corticocancerous chips and uh, philos plate was applied we had to give an adjoint therapies because of the osteoporosis teriparatide vitamin d and calcium supplementations and uh, we could achieve a good fixation on the table she was kept in uh, sling for about 3 weeks during which only the elbow mobilization was allowed and looking at the porosis we waited for 3 weeks to start with pendulum exercises and then assisted flexion abduction up to 6 weeks and then active mobilization at the end of 6 weeks and this is a 6 months follow up x ray and this is the function at the end of 6 months so uh, in spite of having uh, comorbidities and uh, osteoporosis uh, we could get a fairly good functional outcome in, a, in this 61 year diabetic hypertensive lady this is a second case this was a 67 year old male and this was a 5 week old proximal humerus and he had lot of stiffness in the shoulder the x ray was showing that uh, the greater tuberosity is going up and uh, the lateral x ray showed that there was an angulation so there was a, a dilemma whether we should leave him alone or uh, uh, we should do any osteosynthesis and try to get correction of this particular deformity after discussing with the patient and when the patient demanded yes you can go ahead if you can give me a better function especially the abduction we decided to go ahead and uh, we mobilized the fracture we could get the tuberosity down with the sutures and the tuberosity was uh, fixed to the plate uh, through the ethibond sutures we put some bone substitute in the form of allogran in that area and did a philos plate fixation and this is a 3 months follow up x ray you can see that the tuberosity was maintained in position and this is a 6 months follow up and this is his range of movement he had got almost full range of movements of abduction little restriction on external rotation but otherwise the patient was extremely happy so if we can offer something better even in a situation where there is a dilemma of whether you should conserve or whether you should operate i think one can offer operative treatment and get better functional outcome as compared to the uh, conservative method of treatment thank you okay any thank you dr any, Carter, any questions yeah yeah can i yes sure. yes please yeah so yes. just just uh, uh, on the second case yes i i fully agree that if i can uh, give something better than the natural course of the disease um, yes i would and uh, i fully agree with that but recently i mean I, i've just changed my practice because of this so that the dilemma goes away so there is a beautiful classification by professor herbert rich in 2016 where his classification starts from the scapular lateral view he doesn't look at the ap view the type a is a neutral where there is no anterior posterior uh, angulation type 2 okay. is a uh, anterior posterior angulation but not up to the extent which the knee uh, advise knee set 45 degrees he brings it down to 20 degrees so any anterior posterior angulation beyond 20 degrees will not give you the functional results because of the head of the humerus only one fifth of the head of the humerus is in contact with the glenoid at any given point of time so the, more than 20 degrees of anterior posterior angulation will not be able to compensate for all other deficits so he advises correction of that angulation in the scapular lateral plane either anterior or posterior Uh, beyond 20 degrees 
So if I measure on the X-ray, on the scapular lateral view, which you shown, if it is more than 20, significantly more than 20, 25 degree, I will go in for correction. If not, I'll leave it as such. And I have done that in young pilots uh, who I could not, who I did not operate and they are doing well having obtained the uh, uh, clearance from the Indian Air Force. Second point he says is the varus valgus, which we know, of course, the Mir had already told 45 degrees in varus valgus. Everything has been yeah. studied, but the scapular lateral view was not studied and there's a useful classification in cases of dilemma I have found. Thank you so much. Sir. Okay, thank you. Point taken. Thank uh, there is a question from uh, Dr. Bhattacharya that is it possible to tie down GT after five weeks of fracture? Yeah, uh, yes. we mobilized the GT and uh, after mobilizing, we took sutures of ethibon through that and then we uh, tied it down to the uh, uh, plate uh, through the holes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Smarajit Patnaik, uh, how many medial buttress screws are more and uh, how many are enough? Medial buttress screws. Yeah, uh, one or two uh, one or two screws are good enough, you know, for the buttress. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other questions from the faculty? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I would like to ask. Yes, Dr. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What and when do you think a unique prosthesis works in the first case? What's your thought on that? Yeah. Unique any, prosthesis. Any comment yeah. on the unique prosthesis in which has come completely intramedullary prosthesis? Okay. Uh, the, moment, the, moment, the next case, I think we can discuss it after that. Yeah, I think because there is a case on that, so I think we will I'm discuss sharing the on case. that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Next, uh, thank you, Dr. Kakatkar, for an excellent uh, those two excellent cases. Now, next, uh, may I invite Dr. Sanjay Dhar to present his case. Dr. Dhar uh, is a professor of orthopedics at D.Y. Patel Medical College, Nabi Mumbai, and is the ex-secretary of Bombay Orthopedic Society. Dr. Dhar, please. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Monty. First of all, I must thank IOA Committee and Bombay Orthopedic Society and Maharashtra Orthopedic Association to allow me share my experiences. And so far, we had an excellent discussion, thanks to Delhi Orthopedic Association members. Uh, what I am presenting is something relevant to the past discussion so far. Uh, um, we had uh, some excellent cases done by Dr. Maheshwari and Dr. Agarwal with fibula. Uh, so I am presenting a similar case, uh, something not a old case, but a sort of a something which you will see after the lockdown around three to four weeks post injury, a classic four part <coughs> uh, fracture of the proximal humerus with fracture of the greater tuberosities. Of, uh, and significant amount of valgus of the head and uh, MRI CT was done. MRI showed vascularity, it was not avascular. Although I am one of the um, believers that avascular in shoulder doesn't matter so much um, because you get revascularization in most of the cases around 70 to 80% cases in spite of the avascular necrosis. So uh, what I'm more worried is about the quality of fixation, stability of the construct and restoration of and what every surgeon in shoulder should be worried about is restoration of the tuberosities into the right position, the right anatomy, and then restoring the medial buttress. So that probably gives the longevity to the construct. So here was this case, which is around three to four weeks in an old lady around 66, osteoporotic, um, a little obese also. So I was worried. I had kept everything on the table. I uh, uh, both the fixation uh, methods as well as hemi also. Luckily, uh, I order Hemi from a company which has something which Dr. Mukhi was saying, unique. So what we, we had the CT, you can see there is, on CT there seems to be some split in the head, which was worrying me. So about that's why I had kept Hemi uh, available on the shelf. So we went ahead to the usual deltovectoral approach. I will not give the details of the surgery because I'm sure all of you might be knowing, but just an option here. Uh, so that we can discuss all the modalities once again together. So what is most important in this is that you can keep the head. I do not deliver the head out on the table because uh, it's whatever vascularity it has on the medial side and the posterior medial side, I would like to keep it there rather than 
getting it out and ensuring that this is a completely dissociated head. So I keep it in the um, joint itself. And what is more important is take a good hold on the tuberosities, get it together, tie it all to the... It is a space filling process. The stem is a space filling. It fills the proximal metaphysis quite well and gives you a lot of metaphysial hold. Plus you can put the tuberosities back in the position. You can tie them very nicely. Most of the times you don't need to take a hole uh, in the metaphysis to tie your the tuberosities. So your the locking screw which is there, it is itself gives you a good hold. So that is what was done and this is the follow-up. So uh, this is the post-op x-ray. Uh, and this is a, and what is important is that the medial buttress, the wall, here it seems a little distracted if you can see. It seems a little distracted. What is important is there that you have these two in contact so that the vascularity is not disrupted. Somehow we probably pulled it too much, uh, but I still was satisfied with the restoration of the angle and position of the tuberosity <coughs> very nicely. And this is the post-op uh, uh, X-ray. Post six, four weeks, one month, good callus seen in the uh, area around tuberosities. There was no collapse. And uh, I don't have the X-rays because the post uh, these moments, because it is now almost six months post-operatively, she has a reasonably good range. Although I always believe that in the hemi, a bad result of uh, fixation is still better than a reasonably good result of a hemi. They have a good range of movement. So uh, this is it. I will also go to the second case. This is just to make it continuity so that the dis discussion is common. I have changed my second case with the permission of Sopnil. Uh, uh, it is not the dislocation now. I'm just showing. This was her uh, serial x-rays. I'll go to the second case quickly. So this is a failed implant. Again, in a 60-year-old lady, osteoporotic. So uh, as Dr. Agarwal and Dr. Maheshwari showed good, excellent results with fibula. Uh, but uh, seeing an implant inside for a long time, not very sure about the infection, not very particular about the um, second surgery failing or whether it doing well. So I thought of a very old technique, but uh, forgotten now, where you just use ethibone sutures, tie them all. There's a good paper, a Greek paper on that where you get all the tuberosities and then tie them to each other and to the metaphysis cross it and restore a reasonable head shaft, neck shaft angle. And they do reasonably well. She's doing well. The only problem she had was biceps pain. And as I think Dr. Agar, uh, uh, somebody said that biceps is a very common source of pain in such cases. And I always try to do a tenotomy and then, you know, this is for biceps. Tenor. So that is the, I don't have a long-term follow-up because one of my residents is under quarantine. And so uh, I could not get to the post of X-ray, but she's doing reasonably well. The fracture has united and you have to trust me for that. So we can go for the discussion. Okay, there is a comment from uh, Dr. Uh, Trika that uh, will intramedullary fibula also have the same result with distraction and suturing the tuberosities? Yeah, I means if you have distracted too much, your head is uh, so, Ideally, you should try to preserve the medial vascular leash. Whatever attachment is there, instead of delivering the whole head out and seeing that whether there is attachment, I think you should keep it manipulated inside with your fingers. You can use three gloves and then try to manipulate it, get into a good position. In fact, if the surface of somebody I had in the chat had said that amount of head you need, even 70, you can, uh, the, uh, the good thing about this unique, just unique is that you can even downsize your head. Because usually what the range we finally get in these revision cases or even severely injured cases is not the full range. So your need of the full humeral head is not so much. So you can even downsize your head and then you can use the same head even if there is the complete head is not present. So you can get a good range. And if at all it fails, the good thing about this is that you can just change the head and put a hemi head on it and that you are back. You don't need to revise the stem. You just have to... And also there is, you can even shift your retro and a little bit of antiversion with this. So there's a lot of maneuverability. It is not a, uh, a method which is routinely used now. I have heard my colleagues who said that this also has failed. 
but i have done almost two i have just done two cases so far uh, no failures so far and a reasonably satisfactory range of motion dr raman agarwal says that a unique prosthesis doesn't uh, give you an option to tie the tuberosities yeah yeah it gives you you can tie. the tuberous method is same because you okay. are no dr dhar it doesn't you have to flatten the proximal part of the lateral surface and tie the tuberosities you can tie it to the plug you know this uh, locking plug or you can make a hole in the metaphysis and tie them okay. across can i can i go back to the uh, case the pre op x ray yeah one minute the first one or the second one the valgus where we have done a unit first first one. Uh, first one okay you can see it here pre op pre op pre op yeah the gt is broken Yeah, it was the LT broken? Yeah, yeah, all the four was broken. You can see okay. the CT also. So yeah, you have to take a suture in the subscapularis also along with the. Yeah, LT was also gone. Yeah. Yeah. So th this fracture because the medial hinge is still intact. Yeah. That is an important thing that. So happen. medial hinge is intact pre-op, and this is technically will make it type one B. not even type 2 in a valgus fracture classification so medial hinge is intact and it is not the tuberosities which have gone up it is the head which has gone down yeah so uh, for me personally speaking i mean i would just elevate the head to its normal yeah. position uh, tag the tuberosities and put a phylos and come out of course with some graft could be yeah at fibula but on Bula. table on table we had just a sphere of the head there it was a uh, anatomical neck fracture so uh, considering her old age 60 years old uh, yeah, yeah, yeah the hold of screws and all that so because the, this fracture the whole thing yes, depends I, on I the i agree with you that uh, fixation still remains the gold standard for all these fractures medial medial perihangeal periosteal hinge is the most important thing in yeah. these fractures and such fractures do very well uh, yeah. with fixation as well डॉक्टर and yeah. that that works well so if you position your tuberosities nicely below the head in yes. fact you may not yeah. need graft also yeah. <laughs> well doctor yeah, bachar has asked whether it is possible to tie the tie down the gt after 5 weeks of the fracture as you can bring it down any yeah, difficulty yeah. with that yeah 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 no, if, you have, if, if you are not able to get it that means your height is not been restored right Doctor, Doctor Maheshwari, you have some question here. I think uh, the problem with this, see, even in shoulder replacement for non-traumatic problem, we are going away from using stem implants because using a stem implant itself is a problem. You can cause fracture, you can cause stress fracture later on. That's number one objection to using this implant. Number one. Second is you cannot collapse this head, as in your case. the head is lying away now once the head is lying away there is all the problem of avn as well as non union so i think these are two little deterrent in my mind that i want to use this something right way you can collapse the head it is up to you how much you distract it in my case it was little over distracted what is important is on siam you have to see that your medial shenton line is restored quite nicely and it is continuous there is no break so if so that's they a, that's something you can play with is it yeah yeah you can play with it okay डॉक्टर अगर वाला इज कमेंटेड फॉर ऑप्शंस टू जैक अप द हेड बट रमन का नगर वाला इज कमेंटेड दैट यूनिक हैज गॉट मोर फेलियर्स देन सक्सेस मे बी माय एक्सपीरियंस इज वेरी शॉर्ट एंड आई एम आई हैड अ पर्सनल टॉक डॉक्टर मुखी मस्ट बी हैविंग डन मेनी नो आई हैड अ पर्सनल टॉक विद बॉयलो व्हेन आई मेट हिम एट द अमेरिकन एकेडमी ही सेड दिस यूनिक प्रोसेस इज बीइंग सोल्ड टू द अंडर डेवलप्ड कंट्रीज in france it has got lot of problems please don't use it <laughs> this is what he gave me personally dr mukhi okay, dr honest. dr mukhi dr. let dr. us uh, dr yeah. mukhi nobody in france knows about evolutis company we all know that nobody yeah, knows i agree <laughs> i yeah i agree. 
<laughs> you're, you're rightly so. I, 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 was, I, was, I was with Gregory in his OT to learn the eunuch, how to do a eunuch in Paris. Yeah. But I was not yeah. convinced and I came back this Bilbo yeah. Kelly fact yeah. and I, I never did it. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Dhar yeah. and uh, Dr. Mukhi, can you just uh, highlight what are the drawbacks in the technicalities of using unique processes? No, I, I have not used it. I'm, okay. I'm using it instead cement, synthetic bone and fibula. Okay. Dr. Dhar, yeah. uh, can you Auto just... Uh, cancellous bone in young. No, technique-wise, it's a very simple technique. Anybody who is doing a hemiorthoplasty can do yeah. this very nicely. Only issue is, as I said, medial leash. If the medial uh, soft tissue is not intact or you are not very sure, so you have head which is probably floating on the, uh, your prosthesis template. The second thing is that uh, the, the staple which is to be put inside, so you have to be very sure that it is in the center. If your staple is little off or you try to oversize your staple in the base plate, you might make an error so that your staple is out or it is penetrating your head and finally it will fail. So that is that one. That's what I said. It is better to err on the downsized so you can use a smaller head. And uh, if your medial Shenton line is well restored and your uh, tuberosities are well attached and firmly attached, which is gold standard for every case, in fact, or even plating. So all that is done, I think. And it's a proximal filling process. There is no chance of distal hold. So, if your metaphysis is good, then you can get a good hold. Do, do you have adequate uh, small sizes available for uh, yeah, yeah, small There is a lot of modularity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of modularity in this. Problem. Can I speak? Yes, sir. Yeah. Please. Rotational instability is a problem. And uh, it sometimes uh, uh, putting in a process, intramedullary processes requires a lot of, uh, you know, leverage to the head which actually could make it more avascular than, than leave it uh, vascular. So I believe uh, uh, it is a little uh, little dicey uh, procedure. I, I did uh, soft, yeah, soft few, tissue, soft not tissue. Very convinced, uh, as uh, Dr. Raman Khan says, not very convinced really. Soft tissue integrity is a problem which one has to be very sure of. There is a question from uh, YouTube, Dr. Smarajit Patnaik. How did you maintain the head soft angle? With unique? In unique. Yeah. Head shaft angle is inbuilt. It, it is in the uh, it process. Itself. It's a fixed uh, angle uh, process. Yeah, yeah. But you can okay. shift, you can change the height. Uh, you can increase the offset. Head okay. shaft. And you can also change the version a little bit. Okay. That would depend where you fix the uh, fix the head portion. The, yeah. the yeah. You can either put it in some amount of retro or yes. put it in anti-version. Yeah. So depending on your contact with the glenoid, so yeah. whether it is dislocating or not dislocating at what level, so you can change it. Dr. Raman Agrawal, you raised your hand. Yeah, sir, I mean, just, just to, because uh, there's a large audience, there must be a large audience. Yeah. And Dr. Dhar said, anybody who can do a shoulder hemiarthroplasty, I have failed 50% of the times to do a shoulder hemiarthroplasty. If there is one thing which is most difficult in shoulder, that is hemiarthroplasty. I don't know how many people, how many, how many people who are routinely not doing shoulder surgery will actually get it right. Uh, so yes, this procedure probably slightly better than hemiarthroplasty because it's intramedullary and you are doing it in type three, type four fractures which are not displaced much. Second thing which I wanted to commend, Dr. Dhar, that you said that not to take out the head out of the joint. Nobody would like to take out a located head outside the joint. But a head which is dislocated is already out of the joint. So what I'm saying is that if you are committed to conserving the head, it is better to keep it inside. No, no, no. If it is a dislocated... If you are committed to hemi, then you might as well play with it. it is no, 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 Dr. Dhar, I'm saying like in the cases, it is already a fracture dislocation we are treating. Still, which is not, which still is not, unless you are sure that there is no soft tissue attached to it, you better need, need not take it out. Once you have ensured that there is no soft tissue attachment and it can be easily taken out and you have planned an hemi, you may as well take it out. Okay. okay. Well, a question from sure. Dr. Agarwal, Sharad Agarwal to everybody, that if one at all one has to choose a replacement in a young patient, which one has better long-term survivability, hemi or total shoulder replacement? Or reverse shoulder. Reverse shoulder. Anybody can take it. Can you repeat the question, please? And in young persons, if at all you have to do, what you will choose, hemi or uh, reverse shoulder? There's no question of using reverse in a young as far as possible, not even hemi. 
actually we are going away from using processes in young people as you have seen the extreme example which dr raman kant has shown in my knowledge there is no head which is not reconstructible almost no head even split head you can just reconstruct it may look funny it may heal in a mal position you always have a backup plan of going in again for a hemi or a resurfacing which is a better operation rather than doing a primary hemi where it will not heal tuberosities will not heal it will be a failure so there is hardly any indication of primary replacement except a few very selected cases so I, even in the head split there is a new classification which has been proposed by a very senior shoulder surgeon he proposed it in uh, by by dr mark shivel of head split fracture there are four types the only thing is no radiologist has looked at the head split fractures from the top once we start looking like in a scapular lateral view and we take our scanner to look down on the head of the humerus we will be able to identify different lines of the fracture which are splitting the head whether how much frag big fragment is there so if one looks at the shebel's classification and the way he looks at in a 3d ct he looks at the head many of the heads will be able to be reconstructed and saved just a mere I, shadow just a mere shadow of double shadow on a ap x ray is not an indication for replacing the head and i have seen quite a few cases of head avn where the head is totally gone i and have it yes functions very good yes. functions yes. because the key to shoulder function is not no. really the head it is the tuberosities and the rotator cuff i agree that's why i showed the second case where in spite of all the defects and all you preserve the head and preserve the tuberosities you can still get good function yeah just yeah. by putting all the three things in together. the in the second case in the last x ray the head uh, still looks subluxated yeah that is because deltoid atrophy that finally it comes back okay well, now dr hitesh sir no wants a remark about the guiding the indication in trauma situation stem versus non stem replacement or a fixation fixation most of the times i am sure fixation. and as i said fixation. even a bad fixation is better than a good average <laughs> average hemi and there is no role of any stemless uh, hemi in trauma. in trauma there is no role of stemless hemi i categorically <laughs> stated that no role of hemi trauma stemless hemi in trauma agar wo wants to know uh, not in acute uh, trauma but hemi can be used in a mal united head Oh, well, no. that's united. Yeah. Yeah. Not in fresh. United. Yeah. Not in fresh. Mr. Shraddha Dalal was, was uh, wanted to know whether the between the uh, option between hemi and the total shoulder replacement, not reverse. Okay. In in a in a trauma situation, when the tuberosities mm. are fractured, there is no role of total shoulder replacement. Total shoulder replacement requires intact rotator cuff mechanics. The results of total are not that better. People are not happy. In a sequence. So in a sequence well, of trauma yes there is there is a place for total when the tuberosities have healed in decent position where we don't have to osteotomize the tuberosities but the moment you have to osteotomize the tuberosities you cannot do total so in a fractured tuberosity we cannot do total in a mal position tuberosity we cannot do total now one warning to trauma surgeons particularly uh, because reverse is a easy operation to do technically on the table because everything is exposed the head is out you don't have to bother about the rotator cuff and lot of people just jump on it because it's easy to do but trauma reverse is one of the more difficult operation again because you can get head and uh, that do not spare in place but your cuff is not there particularly posterior cuff is not there it doesn't work so don't be very quick to do a reverse also in a trauma situation if you are not very used to it it's a difficult operation and i i fully agree with dr maheshwari when i having done quite a number of reverse shoulder replacement my complication rate in the first 40 was 30% there is not a single complication which has not happened with me in my first 50 cases not a single one every complication has happened i have to deal with every complication and now the learning curve is increasing so complication rate is going down so eventually now my complication has rate has dropped to 20 22% which is equivalent to the ward standard but in first 50 was 30% and problem with the failure of reverses there is no other option no answer no really answer take it easily yeah. <laughs> and yeah. the life of a reverse shoulder is 10 years 
So yeah. you can't do it in the young. But now I think we have had a good session where we have preserved the hell all the way. Even in the worst <laughs> situation, head preservation has worked very well. That's, That's a good one. We all, to we all want yes. to preserve our heads, sir. <laughs> even if, even in neglected trauma. <laughs> even in neglected. So well, don't throw the head into the bin. Oh, yeah. Now we'll go to the last one. Once you throw it, you cannot retrieve it back. Yeah. <laughs> no, you can well, Raman, it. Was, a, Raman was about every, to throw. <laughs> everything can be retrieved from the computer. I'll be honest. The, Except the time and the head. Well, now the time is coming up now. Once he fell on the floor, I didn't <laughs> Well, now we'll go to Thank the next you. presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mukhi. Dr. Mukhi is oh, the yeah. professor and head of KJ Sumai Medical College. And now he'll uh, show his cases. Dr. Mukhi. Yeah. Can you please share your screen, Dr. Mukhi? Yeah, yeah please. Hey, does anybody this, use, by the, the way, six. about the fallen uh, bone, uh, bone coming outside and putting in betadine and putting it back again? I have done it once. Okay. And I have it... done it many times. When I have done it. <laughs> not only, not only <laughs> in shoulder. <Twice. laughs> this is not this only, is... not only, yeah, radial not head only once. in shoulder. Radial head once and... <laughs> no, humeral humeral yeah. head had fallen in a four-part fracture dislocation, neglected. It fell on the floor. I immediately asked to pick it up by a Alice Forsett, put it into betadine, 20 minutes washed, betadine, put it back. This is off the record. No infection. No, infection. <laughs> <laughs> no operation was fine. <laughs> I, even I have used a radial head like that. Yeah. And there is even a procedure of how to and retrieve and sanitize it. <laughs> once it is there. It's a written, <laughs> home, written method. If you lift it within seven seconds, that, is, is there a method? Yes. Fantastic. Lift it within seven seconds. <laughs> See, the Apex Institution confirms it. We are all safe. Don't worry. <laughs> you can quote me big next time. <laughs> yes, Dr. Mukhi, Dr. your screen. Please. And uh, yeah. you have to keep it in BKD for minimum eight minutes. Yes. Anything less possible? than that. Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't work. Eight to ten minutes. Yes, eight to ten minutes. And, okay. Uh, this is a this is a case of a 67 years male. He had two attempts at saving the head for a four part fracture elsewhere, and he was operated. The plate was removed. He was unhappy. Went into AVN and carried on till the age of 67. He went back to that surgeon again, and MRI was done. That showed that the rotator cuff was fairly okay. And this was the thing that he has done. He did a surface coplant shoulder. I want to have the opinion of the house that whether should this be continued. The patient is unhappy. Whether, yeah, I want to have the opinion of Dr. Raman, esteemed opinion of other colleagues also. Sir, we do not have a pre-op axial view or the CT scan of this patient. Exactly, exactly. Now, this view, you can see it over here. Or any other view? Can you see this view? Yes, I can. Yeah. So, the this patient is, is an unhappy patient, unable to lift the hand. Range of movement is just up to 90 degrees. There is pain. So, and uh, he has come for the opinion whether to continue with it or any other option. So, have we ruled out infection? Totally. Totally. There is no infection. No infection. There is a severe osteolysis around the uh, stem. Severe osteolysis. Yeah. What is the, must be the cause? Yes. And there is severe glenoid erosion retroversion. Yes. I think this is an overstuffed situation also. A lot of neck, yes. this is the resurfacing processes. It should go up to the base of the GT. So yeah. almost five millimeters yeah. there. And that can yes, cause a lot of pain. Yes. And, and there is, and inferiorly, the resection, the inferior osteophyte has not been taken down completely. I mean, that's a technical thing, but we are looking at the causes of pain. So I told him, Please don't wait 
you have 67 if you have a good option with reverse shoulder and this is what we did we did an uncemented stem and this was the post op x ray this is after 2 years any comments on this i think looks good that's the right thing to do in him Roman sir yeah sir absolutely and other colleagues pika and because i am a what you call is jack of all that's what the bombay orthopedic and the viral society calls me <laughs> right and see his movement well done well done mukhi i said never give up and never lose hope he's 67 and i just had a talk with him and he sent me the latest video also and he's extremely happy and i can tell my colleagues that this is not a difficult technique if you can do the hip which is more difficult and the knee this becomes the easier option only thing you have to follow the rules so reverse is easy in a old case where gt has healed particularly posterior yes. gt in a fresh yes. case if you don't take care of the posterior part of the gt reverse fails so i think it's a good option because everything had healed you have to just stabilize the shoulder and change the biomechanics but the gt posterior part was already healed so you had a better option no. to do a reverse and that's the reason it is successful but right. in such in cases because it has been operated two times and it is a scar three, gt three, scar, three times three times scar three, cuff plate removal of plate trying AVN, yeah. trying and uh, trying to uh, uh, expose the glenoid the posterior limit of glenoid when we do external rotation there is lot of stress on the gt and it has happened with me gt has come off so be prepared to keep the trauma stem with you when you are doing such reverses anybody uses cement we prefer a cement because i did a uncemented so with a trauma stem we will use a cement but uh, uh, otherwise uncemented there is a question that how do you ensure uh, central placement of head in the glenoid by dr uh, ravi shota in which in this uh, glenoid is glenoid glenoid is not affected it's not an issue so it's easier you have to just go according to the dictums that you have to follow and aim at the coracoid process that's it and you don't require excessive retroversion in this case 10 maximum 20 that's the rule and you have to put the stem in a slightly vulgar position 145 to 150 and you have to see there is no notching if you follow these rules and if you suture back your cuff which i take learned it from professor walsh because he always sutures the subscapularis always and he was presenting it in ccgr in las vegas also and he could not retrace the subscapularis mind you he took out the whole thing again back again and got the subscapularis out and repaired it and sutured it back to its anatomical position that was the sincerity of that person in front of almost 3000 ccgr delegates viewing him that the master has not been able to pull out the subscapularis which he has dumped it down it got stuck and then he had to take it out and that video is still available on the youtube and on the professor walsh the glenoid bone stock has to be adequate uh, to do a reverse shoulder. Suppose yes. in small glenoids, or if there's a defect in the glenoid because of you know your uh, hemi orthoplasty, whatever has been done, is it not a difficult to put the you know glenoid part of the reverse shoulder? No, in this case, it was not that difficult at all. It was a very easy job to do it in this case. I'm being honest. 
Well, in this case, the erosion is not much. Yeah. But if it, if there yeah. is a sufficient bone loss, you have to build yeah. up. Yeah. yeah. That is where the difficulty yeah. lies. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Those are difficult yeah. reconstructions. Yeah. Yes. And Can I go ahead? Yeah, the, the comments by Dr. Raman yeah. Agarwal, sometimes it's not possible to repair the soft scab. The acceptable limit uh, of, of uh, version range in reverse is plus 2, minus 10 degrees. Plus it's 2, okay. to minus 10 degrees. Yeah. You at least try. If you can't, it's okay. okay. And you have to see that your tension, that is the main thing, the shock test is good. And it doesn't dislocate on the table, then it will not dislocate later. Okay. That's it. Next, next. The shock test. Yeah. This is a 50 year old man. He is a garage worker. And this is how he presented. He had a four part fracture, maybe. And this is how when the locking plates were not available. This is now, after three weeks, he comes to me. What should I do? Any opinions? Sir, we have discussed in the morning. If today yeah. you do, you have all those options. Yeah. Reconstruct. Agreed. That time, I was a student, which I am also today, and I didn't know the reverse shoulder. And I get to do a reconstruction. No reverse. And this is what I did. Yeah. Even huh? today, no reverse, sir. Even today, I will not do reverse. Yes. I'm a trauma surgeon. <laughs> yeah. Even shoulder surgeons wouldn't do. Wouldn't do. Agree. No reverse. Yeah. Any comment on this? Raman, sir? Fantastic. It looks fantastic, sir. But, uh, yeah. uh, but uh, you could have put fibula, Dr. Ravi tells that you could have put... Agree. I, I put cancellous bones. Can you see the cancellous bones? All packed up. Stuffed like anything. Right. Now, now I know where you had this idea of putting in, in the, your hip fractures also, your K wires and Ender's nail. Yes, yes. <laughs> what is that oblique K wire? Two years. Dr. Mukhi, yeah. may I ask <laughs> you what is that funny K wire? Just go back. Yeah. It is That's demarketing the area sir. of defect. <laughs> this U shaped K wire, like a staple. Yeah, and then using a tension band on that. So that how the greater did, how, how velocity. Did how did I pass it? Oh God. You have to just pass <laughs> it, bend it and hammer it. Like a staple. Like and a staple. then use that like a staple. And okay. then pull it down with a wire so that you are having a tension band. The reins of a horse in, in your hand. Yeah. The <laughs> reins, yes. Good idea. And yes. And this is the result. Mm, but he's he's, doing he's, so if you can bowl in India, result is fantastic. Period. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and True. never ever give up. Yes, he was sir. told your head is avascular. Your head will not be surviving. So reconstruction is out. And now this person, this is a 10 years. Perfect. And he, Thank you so much. Sir. And mind you, he keeps on repairing my car <laughs> without any charge. <laughs> That's important. Yeah. That is the true functional outcome. Yeah. Right? Next play. Next. Oh. No, this was 80, uh, 75 years female. Bilateral fracture. And she was told bilateral reverse. So where to get the money in India? Any opinions on this? Why th this can be reconstructed with a no fibula for... and plating? Why reverse? Yes, yes, exactly. Oh, sensationalizing it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is the technique I've used. Head split. This is what I've done. I filled it up with bone cement and I saw to it 
that the screws were short and if the screws were not short they could migrate then i cut the tip of those screws and made them blunt so that they would put the head back and prevent it from excessive collapse and she just spoke to me she did not give me the result but it is almost now 3 years and she is in her 80s and she said i want to play cricket that's what she told me yesterday imagine take my word if i can use the term if i can use the term the there is a flattening of curve of reverse <laughs> yes exactly the reverse processes is good in the hands of the masters and as sir raman has agreed that there is a law a strong learning curve steep learning curve and he has been so humble he said 20 failures i was frightened if he had told me i would not have tried or was really but because i was doing hip and knee i said let me place my hand on the reverse and see and mind you that person was my own relative kit and kin i did my first reverse on that with that integrity i was there is a question from uh, dr arungasu bhatacharya percentage yes. of uh, post op dislocation after reverse shoulder replacement in your hand how you solved three, those cases yeah those three things you have to understand don't put use excessive reverse shoulder right reverse angle should not be more than 20 second is your tension if your shock test is lax it has to be tight and if you can get your abduction all the movements on the table and no dislocation and always go little on a tighter side in the indian patient that is my choice so that you can open up and rotate the cartilage a little more the plastic one and give a little more length and you must see that your length from the pectoralis major to the tip of the acromion is minimum 5 cm that you measure it on the opposite side then you will never dislocate okay three points i told you the tension the length of pectoralis to the acromion and checking on the table shock test okay is it okay yeah great great so thank you sir thank, yeah thank you thank you dr mukhi for the uh, excellent cases it is uh, just we are reach 1 o'clock and uh, on behalf of uh, maharashtra orthopedics uh, association and bombay orthopedic society i would like to thank uh, and offer our gratitude to the president of indian orthopedic association dr uh, rc meena dr atul shivastav the secretary of indian orthopedic association and uh, all the you know faculties and uh, president and secretary of delhi orthopedic association dr raman kant agrawal and dr hitesh lal and all of you faculty for an excellent presentation now over to dr uh, karne and dr sopnil kani uh, on the background uh, we didn't tell the names uh, that uh, dr pradeep nemade dr sandeep biraris and uh, dr dhiraj sanawane dr siti choudhary and uh, dr uh, mohesh khade they are on the background they are not seen here but they have done a great job in order to bring this uh, you know this platform dr over to dr sapnil kani followed by dr uh, uh, karne to wind up the meeting thank you yeah on the behalf of the bombay orthopedic society uh, and the maharashtra orthopedic association i thank all the wonderful faculty uh, since i was following youtube we had more than 500 people uh, watching this webinar and i'm pretty certain that this has given a lot of perspective to most of our members and has uh, opened up uh, probably new avenues for people to think and act uh, sincerely since we are in a position where all of us are right now locked down at home it gives us a lot of thought and a lot of uh, fodder for introspection so i thank the delhi orthopedic association uh, dr agarwal dr lal and uh, all the faculty present here for wonderful presentation and to dr mukhi as well for his words of wisdom thank you very much everyone. thank you thank you sir dr karne please concluding thank you sir thank you
thank you thank you our faculty for such a wonderful presentation and uh, so many things are cleared and uh, we got uh, you know uh, your experience of so many years and we are not we are general orthopedic surgeons just like dr mukhi but then we have seen certain cases especially when the head is out and uh, free still you can put it back and continue there are lot many things we have learned today and on top of that we really appreciate that we finished right in the time even with such a detailed discussion i thank uh, delhi orthopedic uh, association for inaugurating i can say that they have they are a flagship of uh, our this momentum program and uh, i thank dr agarwal dr hitesh lal for being in touch with us for last one week and that uh, managed things very nicely thank you all faculty thanks for uh people who are real backbone of this is uh, dr sopnil keni dr birari dr nimade and dr sunawani who have worked so hard to make this successful i thank everybody thank you very much let's close the meeting thank you very much